Hello? So, sadly, it's fucking rubbish. <laughs> Wait, what's rubbish? Um, this is me without headphones, but it might be even worse than it was with. I don't know why my, my uh, Skype doesn't seem to be sort of connecting to the internet. It hasn't updated since the 19th of December from the looks of it. Oh, so yeah, Skype is kind of a weird guy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have Discord, so... All right. Well, um, um, I mean, this isn't horrible. It's okay. I've talked too much worse, so <laughs> this is okay. All right. Well, is it okay? Is it? Is this any? Uh, can I pop in my headphones? Is that okay? Um. Yeah. Sure. Or was that considerably worse? All right. I'll do that. So before we start, I have to say that I've pretty much only seen your content when you've been uh, debating idiots. And so I might have a really skewed perception of the conversations you have. So like when you were on with No Bullshit um, yeah. and uh, John Tron, I think, and also recently with the Kumite. So <laughs> this is obviously going to be a very <laughs> different conversation because <laughs> sure. I won't insult you <laughs> routinely yeah, that's or go good. back to points we've already moved on from. Sure. Um, what Was there... Um... What specifically do you want to talk about? I only saw like that small clip of the video. I've seen so much stuff over the past few days that I've haven't had time to watch well, it in long form. No, it's it's fine. Well, I it was really more that um, people had brought up whether or not um, we should talk because I was doing a, a chat with Kevin Logan, mm -hmm. and we were talking about just some of the drama, and that included the the, the, the just complete. Gar dump dumpster fire that was you battling like four people at once in a in an ongoing stream and someone said it would be interesting for you to talk to destiny and i said yeah that would be fantastic but really beyond that and then you're like hey you want to chat and i said yeah that sounds cool so i can we can come up with a topic or we can find a topic for a different day i'm totally flexible about what you want to how you want to do it um Fuck. I'm normally on the... It's normally the other people that has a topic. Um, what, um, <laughs> did you did you have anything in mind, I guess, in regards to... I guess the easiest place to start is there any... Do you know anything um, about any of that conversation, like parts that you disagreed with or anything? Or Well, I think one thing that I or, could or add... Actually, perhaps, oh, I'm sorry, actually, back up. Yeah. Let me back up one quick second. Do you want to introduce yeah, yourself yeah. so that people know who you are? Sure. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I didn't really, yeah, I'm so... Hi, everyone. I'm Christy. I have a YouTube channel. I am... A, uh, well, I started off in politics and then did my PhD and did, I do research, um, but my channel is a, a lot of sort of what's topical, what's going on in recent weeks because there's been so much drama. I've been sort of following that on the other side of, of YouTube sort of political spectrum from myself. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, I, I am sort of my, professionally, I guess you'd say a political scientist, uh, but on YouTube, I'm, I'm a YouTuber. Gotcha. That's me. When you say um, political scientist, what exactly does that imply? Do you do like polling data or do you do like campaign stuff or? I do. Well, I started off with my PhD doing quantitative survey data analysis, and that's where I, I did my doctoral research using uh, survey data. But after I did my um, postdoctoral fellowship with the British Academy, I founded a qualitative election study where it's more like a Frank Luntz, even though I, do, I don't like the way he runs his focus groups, uh, sort of approach to understanding elections. And that is um, we do focus groups with you know, anywhere between 11 and 17 groups around the UK, well, actually around Britain. Um, it's the British election study, not the UK election study, because Northern Ireland is like its whole other thing. Sure. Um, so we do the British election study. And then we go back and we talk to them after the election to see what their reactions were and what they think about things going, ha going ahead. And that's been my sort of my main research focus since about 2010. Yeah. Okay, cool. Hmm. Um, okay, yeah. And on that sort of, because one of the topics that came up was this discussion about um, a, a, a thought experiment for um, people who have, who are, are attracted to children. Oh, God. The, that study. But I wanted to come at it, no, actually more from um, why I think it would be very difficult to implement that study. There, yeah, I mean, there's is, a million reasons why it would be difficult. Yeah. yeah. 
the, the, my, my the problem, ethics. Yeah, my problem with these are never that it would be difficult. It's the um, it's when people question the difficulty and assume that I would take an extremely irrational approach to it. Oh, so, for yeah. instance, someone will pose like, "Well, what if you couldn't get anybody to consent to doing this?" Which is a very real, <laughs> yeah. like that's a very real thing. Yeah. So it's like, but what do you what do you think my answer is going to be? That well, we'll just force them to do it to relive the trauma. Like obviously, yeah. at that point, you would kill it. You know, yeah. Um, well, you must have felt a little bit like you were starring in The Wizard of Oz because everyone was treating you like a straw man. Yeah. I, um, I, the problem <laughs> is I have history with so many of these people. Um, they're... <sighs> So my background is basically I did um, video games and I was um, I do video games half and half. I do video games and I do politics. Um, and the thing that kind of pushes me towards the political side of it is that I don't know if you're familiar with this with the stereotype of a gamer, bro. I don't know if you follow sure. like, the Gamergate stuff and all that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of that stuff that goes on in this community. Um, so I kind of got interested in politics, but I'm also really interested in um, I, I say this somewhat pretentiously. Philosophy is very interesting to me, um, in, in that I grapple with it in a very kind of like surface level way. So I don't engage with like um, academics as much. Although I'd like to, to get like some understanding of some literature at some point. Um, but but so so I engage with that stuff as best I can. Um, as part of doing that, there have been interesting questions that we've discussed on my stream because I think they're really interesting topics. So like a question like um, this is a very this is a very big one that a lot of people have me over is like is incest like a like a morally wrong thing? Um, and it's an interesting question because it's a position that people typically have a revulsion to intrinsically, but then upon introspection, you find that you have a very hard time justifying that revulsion on like any type of like verbal level, you know. Um, so these are just kinds of like interesting questions we have, and and people start to hammer me over these like oh so you love incest. You know, just because we talk about these topics on stream. Um, but I'm very interested in grappling with the philosophical side of a lot of arguments. There was a guy called, do you know who Amos E is or whatever? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so there's yes, a, I do. Yeah, so he pushes, for, um, he pushes for a position where he believes that the age of consent should be eliminated completely. He thinks that sexual relationships between even a child as young as zero or, or like one or two years old with, an, with a fully grown adult, that these can be consensual relationships. Um, this is something that philosophically I find quite easy to attack because the concept of informed consent is very much rooted in my, in, in my ethical background, that it's a very important thing to understand, especially with children, because children can't really protect themselves. Um, and I noticed that Amos was kind of making his rounds in the um, in the skeptic community and usually he would go on a show and then people would kind of start screaming at him and they'd be like really angry and that was it and that kind of bothered me and I was like okay well let's actually try it so I brought him on I had a discussion with him and in the purview of that I think like child porn came up once and I think he asked a question about like well you, what about this or this or this and at some point, I'd mentioned like this research, and I was like, you know, there might be some slim cases where child porn is acceptable, um, but only if the goal is to reduce the amount of children being abused or something. And then there are like three people that hyper hopped on to that comment and tried to push it as though like I'm a huge child porn supporter. And one of those people was that uh, Brittany girl. And um, yeah, right. so when she hopped into that debate, it was literally just for her to snipe me with that one liner, even though we'd like hashed this out on like a three hour discussion before. So that was a lot of backstory. That's just, that's where that um, if that if that question seemed like really random, that's why that happened. It's because that's like her personal vendetta against me for whatever reason. There was a lot of gotcha moments, a lot of sort of really trying to set up um, a yes or no dichotomy. And when you try to provide wow. context you were just completely like just thrown back into this corner saying no you have to pick a side where either way i've got you yeah and that's yeah. kind of the that's the story though of the uh, that i've noticed i can't speak to your country as much um although i followed a little bit of brexit related stuff but like this right versus left argument is very difficult to have because on, on the right side you know like if it, let's look at like black people in the united states right the right will tell you you know like well what's up with black people they just need to make better choices everybody can make better choices well, okay, I guess like, yeah, that sounds good. But then if you look to the left, like, well, why are black people not making good choices? Well, there's no simple answer to that. It's like, we, we, you need like paragraphs and paragraphs to explain, you know, like, well, Jim Crow laws. Okay, but that was 60 years ago. It's like, okay, yeah, but generational wealth is a real thing. Okay, well, what about this poor guy that's rich? It's like, Jesus, you know, you have to go through like anecdotes. You got to go to appeal to tradition. You got to go to appeal to, to like a million different things that you have to like get through in order to like present your case. And then the person on the right is just going, okay, well, I think people should just make better choices. You know, I had a friend and he made better Better choices and he was poor and now he's rich and it's like okay well fuck like how do i you know it's just really frustrating to deal with that kind of stuff uh believe me dealing with a feminist critique on youtube i i'm familiar with these straw manning concepts oh. and uh and taking an argument that you know uh, rape culture it's it's a word that doesn't really convey the concept very well but they stop at the word and then they sort of create the straw man of what they think it means nobody saying, approves Saudi Arabia of rape. Has a, yeah exactly <laughs> 
like, oh, the survey data shows that people don't approve of rape. I'm like, yeah. well, of course it does. I mean, it's that a, doesn't prove you're in a rape culture or not. <laughs> it's like you have like so, no okay. desire to like actually grapple. Like, do you really think that somebody made up a term for the idea that like everybody is in favor of rape? You know, like. And then these same people will go on Twitter being like, I don't understand what the big deal about the Harvey Weinstein stuff is. Like, if your boss asks you for sex, just say no. And it's like, ah, fuck. <laughs> it doesn't, it's just not that easy. Uh. Kind of just wish you could live in a world that was just so simplistic, don't you? <laughs> Where yeah. there weren't power relations and people didn't have to worry about punitive measures or losing their job or not being given a reference and, mm -hmm. you know, sort of driven from their industry because they spoke out against a powerful man. No, no, no. Let's not consider that and just go, hey, you have agency. No one's stopping you from walking over to Human Resources, uh, which is already designed to protect people at the top and all their top stars yeah. and to keep a code of silence and have you sign a non-disclosure agreement. Um, yeah, just walk up to them and tell them the problem and they'll fix it. Like, it feels like our progress sometimes shoots us in the foot. Like, like to be honest, like relationships um, or relationships or status of like women and minorities has increased dramatically over in the Western world. It has improved markedly, but it seems like um, when when you knock out all of the easy problems, the difficult ones become really hard to tackle. You know, and people act like if there aren't like the, this, if it isn't blatant, then it's not real. So like, um, my, I mean, my debate with Sargon, for instance, you know, like, um, and I and I heard that you had one of these as well. I didn't have a chance to watch I it did. beforehand, but um, we we talked a long time about like black people in the United States. States. And he's like, well, you know, um, there's a lot of problems that come from broken families. And it's like, yeah, of course, I agree with that. And he's like, well, if black people just got married, it would fix their problems. And it's like, Sargon, it doesn't really work that way. Like, there's prerequisites to getting married. Like, get, marriage is a symptom, not like a condition. You know, like, marriage is typically a symptom of being successful, being somewhat wealthy. And he's like, okay, but why can't they just get married? Married black people do better than single black people or, or broken family black people. And it's like, okay, yeah, but the getting married is really hard. They're, okay, but why can't they just do it? And it's like, and, th and then it'll go up to the inevitable where Sargon literally asks where is the law preventing black people from getting married and it's like ah, okay dude or where is the law preventing women from choosing engineering degrees uh, right and they're trapped in this sort of almost like first wave feminism which was focused mostly on the, the laws and, and changing mm -hmm. you know things like giving women legal personhood and the ability to own property and to um, have access to their kids or even custody uh, upon divorce and <laughs> vote um, and they think that that's once you have a law in the books then somehow the problem is solved which is really no that's just um, a resetting of the society's values on in legal footing but nothing in the society has automatically changed overnight you know people who are uh, on one side or the other don't suddenly you know have their minds changed because the P supreme court says that now a marriage equality is the law of the land and it's those informal relationships. It's the being discriminated against when you go to a baker and having to take it to court in order to get your equality. Yeah. That's the fight that they don't really want to recognize. And it's kind of with the, the Me Too thing as well. The idea that if you're harassed in the workplace, it's, it's an easy situation to just not uh, to have that taken care of. Or that when you say something, you know, people are going to believe you and not really taking into account, like we were talking about, the power dynamics, the punitive measures that might be taken. And as we saw with quite a lot of the Me Too cases, there was a real power imbalance there. It wasn't like people were going, um, men weren't hitting on women who were above them in power. They were hitting on you know much junior women yeah. who had much uh, less ability to speak up for themselves, like Gretchen Carlson did at Fox. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even uh, that, um, uh, do you have talk radio in the United Kingdom? Well, I'm actually living in Germany now. Uh, oh, so that's right. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why. Half years. That's okay. Oh, that's all right. Because I, I talked about my PhD having done that in the UK. Gotcha. Um, are you are you British? No, I'm actually in a, the States, but then I lived long enough in the UK to sort of have this pick up. A, a, when I talk about British things, I tend to get more of a British accent. When I talk about things back from America, like baseball and brats and going to the mall, then my American accent gets stronger. So it's a little bit situational. And then when I'm in Germany, occasionally I speak German. Gotcha. So. Okay. Um, <laughs> are there like, does talk rate, is talk radio in other countries dominated by right leaning figures like it is in the United States? I have to say that my because my my German isn't as fluent. Mm -hmm. um, I don't listen to a lot of talk radio in the UK. Most of the radio that I listen to, it didn't really ever go over to AM radio. Okay. But in the UK, you've got like six stations of the BBC. Plus, then uh, you have commercial stations, and so uh, I don't really think that there's that kind of. Um, they have more in the newspapers, you know, the Daily Mail and the Telegraph, the Tory Graph, and mm -hmm. th they have uh, the Sun, and so it's primarily more of a, a print-dominated conservative 
conservative voice online now as well. Whereas in the States, media tries to pretend it's neutral and then you get more sort of commentary on the radio. So it's a slightly different dynamic, but that whole, that uh, culture is there just where they get their news from is slightly different. I'd say in the UK from the U S and I don't know about Canada. Gotcha. But I mean, you can definitely see that um, talk radio is moving over to YouTube. Yeah, for that's younger people, the millennial much, yeah. version. Yeah, in the yeah, United that's... States, feel, the talk radio is mainly right leaning, or at least it feels that. I'm pretty sure that's true. I'm positive that's true. Actually, the talk radio is overwhelmingly right leaning. Um, but my guess would be just because talk radio probably appeals to older people more, whereas the YouTube stuff appeals to younger people. But um, and I don't think they're picking up really on the metrics of people like uh, on the alt-right who are getting pretty big audiences and also people who aren't openly alt-right on YouTube but certainly are willing to platform those Ugh. people and entertain their ideas and give them a much wider audience without actually engaging in a, a strong critique and pushback of their claims. Sure. Yeah. To, like the Dave Rubens. <laughs> yeah, basically. Uh, the, um, the, something that's been really frustrating to me recently is 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 I'm actually I'm actually excited that like the ethno state people are becoming more vocal now. Um, I like I, I don't. There's got to be a name for this. Maybe in political um, theory, you have like a better way to describe this. But like, I would rather have you know ten racists, like ten like avowed racists in a room that are openly like I hate black people, I hate Hispanics. I would rather have ten of those people in a room than three of them in a room and seven people that claim to be neutral but like are totally okay with the other three people. Because it makes it so much harder to attack all of them when they can always say, Well at least I'm not that guy. Does that make sense? No, it does. Yeah. We would call it sort of like the difference between people who are, in measurement terms, a manifest variable and a latent variable. For instance, there are people who will identify as being on the sort of neo-fascist alt-right. They would be in favor of a white ethno state. Mm -hmm. They they would hold all the positions. And then you'd have a, a, you do, there is polling data that shows that quite a lot of white people in America, although they won't necessarily go as far as saying a white ethno state, but they think that whites, whites are discriminated against more than any other group. Yeah. And they have, they will agree with a lot of the same grievances. You have mm -hmm. that too with measures of feminism. You have people like myself who will say, yes, I'm a feminist. And then there are other people who, although they don't claim the title of feminist, will basically agree with all the feminist positions that you put on a survey yeah. for them to answer. Those people at this, under the surface sort of not being out and identifying but being sympathetic, I think and that is the, the, the part of the population that's um, hardest to, to sort of engage with because, um, like you said, they can kind of say, oh, I'm not a Nazi because I don't – because I, know, I don't literally want to kill Jews, yeah. Yes. But it's like the problem is always that, like, and this is my big issue with engaging these people. And a lot of people say that, like, well, I'll point out, you know, like, th this is not acceptable kind of thought. And people are like, okay, well, these people aren't technically, you know, racist and whatnot. And it's like, okay. But when you're, like, anti all Muslims, when you're anti all Hispanics, when you have huge issues with African Americans, like, you're you're only like a you're only like a stone's throw away from being like a literal ethno state. It's like you're so close. You're like on the precipice of falling over. Um, and it seems like a lot of people have a really hard time dealing with that because there are so many different ways that you can talk about your beliefs where they're not technically racist, but it plays like so well into like, um, I, I, oh God, it, it, we're, we're like, um, I, the way that I guess that I tangle with, um, with, with JF on this is that, um, are you familiar with the JF guy? Yep. Is that basically what you get is this, um, are you familiar with the difference between like normative or descriptive terms or whatever? I am. Yeah. So like <laughs> you get people that line up 100% on the normatives and then maybe they have like a little disagreement on the descriptive. I don't think it would be very hard to change their descriptives completely. You know, like if you take, this is what makes Trump like such an amazing like propaganda figure is that Trump is like the, the, like, um, like the racist, like perfect candidate because he's not overtly racist, but he, he advocates for almost every policy that you could possibly want for, you know, like getting rid of DACA, right. build the fucking wall, get him out of here, you know, like stop and frisk the, the, the sheriff Arpaio guy or whatever in uh, Ari uh, mm -hmm. Arizona. I think. Yeah. Like everything you could want from somebody that's like a, a blatant racist, but he's not actually a racist. And it's like, ah, uh, yeah. I call it the soft cell 21st century neo-fascist pitch which goes like this. You believe in free speech, right? We should discuss all ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, let me explain to you race realism, and then let me also explain to you why a white ethno state is a good idea. We're just talking, right? Because the bad ideas will be taken out by the marketplace of ideas. Mm -hmm. And then they end up having their discussions, and they try to make their points. And as you say about the normative and this descriptive, 
being a person who's interested in philosophy, you might be familiar with Hume's is ought distinction. Sure. And the, the, what I see a lot happening within those discussions, especially about IQ and, and genetics and the very pr probably small effect that there might be, but also then ignoring things like the Flynn effect, which really have a hard time being explained by, by genetics in terms of IQ changes. Um, and that means um, the Flynn effect is the fact that people are getting smarter over time, that the test, if we would have taken the test from 50 years ago, we would actually, the average score wouldn't be 100, it would be more than 100. Mm -hmm. And so every once in a while, they have to reset sort of the mean score, because over time, we're getting better educated as, a, as societies. Yeah. So you can't explain that with genetics. Well, to, to, to be really careful here, because one of the, this is like the next realm that I'm tr starting to engage with, is the the explanation given is that the Flynn effect will increase the IQs of everybody, but the black-white IQ gap will still hold, showing that environment can increase IQ, but that black people are still intrinsically less intelligent than white people. Well, okay, but by that same logic, if we go back to the 1970s, mm -hmm. when women started running marathons, women's speeds were increasing at a greater rate than men's speeds were, such that people predicted women would be outpacing men in marathons by the 21st century. Sure. That didn't happen because women hit sort of a body max, mm -hmm. right? Whereas men were going up more slowly. So we haven't been studying IQ long enough to know whether or not that gap will remain or whether it can be completely ameliorated sure. by social forces because it might take another 50 to 70 years or you might have to find societies where actually people of different ethnic backgrounds do have the same economic opportunities and median incomes and mm -hmm. graduation rates and college attendance rates. Um, so you, you, we just don't know yet. Yeah, we can't sure. we can't extrapolate based on trends. Well, and that and that that actually isn't even go, going back to the is ought thing. That actually isn't even my main problem. My main problem with the people that talk about it is that. Um, it, 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 there are there are like two different ways that you can come at this topic. So for me, I am interested in what is true at all times. I'm very interested in what the data ends up panning out to be. But I think it's very possible that you could pursue this line of thinking with, with, with some level of compassion for people. Like, for instance, say that you do find out that there are some intrinsic differences between the races, you would, and in, in a, in a in, a, in what I would consider a morally justified world, you would try to you would try to um, rectify that somehow. You know, like um, let let's say that there, for instance, the, the example I always give is people with dyslexia, right? Um, I think a hundred years ago, or whatever, dyslexia is like a strictly negative thing. Like if you have it, you're you're just going to have a really hard time reading. Um, but today, if you get diagnosed with dyslexia at an early age, you know, you can change the education in such a way that this person can pretty much overcome it and read and write and speak and everything, or not speak, but read and write at like the same level as any non dyslexic person. Um, and, and I feel like when I when I watch people talk about the IQ thing is like, okay, sure. Well, let's say that there is, um, let's say that we, we, we establish this as an is, okay? Say that there is a difference in IQ. Well, what, what ought we do now? And it's like, okay, well, what are, what are policy programs that we can implement in order to kind of, you know, deal with this thing so that everybody comes out better? But that's never the case. It's always like, okay, well, we see there's a difference in IQ. IQ is the only thing that matters. We need to deport all of these people and never let any new one. And it's like, okay, well, this isn't very realistic, you know? The other thing I would say, as someone who you know taught statistics for looking at survey data, mm -hmm. is that we're making a big mistake if we take an average mean, or the average or the mean of a population by their ethnic descent, mm -hmm. and somehow generalize that to the wider population. Because in truth, what, what we did was, let's say that there is a six point or a seven or a 10 point difference between different ethnic groups. Um, they're still, the IQs are going to be distributed along a normal distribution, mm -hmm. a bell curve, right? And when you put all of those scores up, there's only the range from like zero to what, 200 or something, maybe a little bit higher. I don't know. I'm not in Mensa. I don't follow these kinds of things. Let's say there's a maximum, whatever the maximum score is, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to have different overlays with broadly similar distributions, just with the means a few different points apart. So the question is, okay, if even if there is a mean dif difference, the distributions would be such that most of the population would basically be in the same yeah. bulk of the range of scores. And this is always so what like do the, we really need to do differently? Yeah, and this is always like my killer question that I ask people. It's like, okay, well, you're really obsessed with like, you're trying to make IQ like this ER number. Like this, you want this to be the most important thing. Then why don't you just talk about deporting all low IQ people? Like, can, can we ship off all of the dumb whites as well and keep like the smart blacks and the smart <laughs> Hispanics, but like they'll never yeah. go there. Or they always like sidestep that into some weird thing. Um, some people bring up like, well, regression to the mean or whatever. And it's like, okay. Or, or some people will say, um, well, 
well, you know, I, I don't know. There's like a million different things that they go from there. But yeah, I have to try really hard not to add harm because I noticed that like one of the most frustrating things is that most of the people that will advocate for this like high IQ ethno state are usually people that don't. <laughs> really have much you know like in terms of like what do you what do you have to show for your like superior master race iq you know like come on dude like have a little bit of you know self-reflection i i just think you know the, the the other question that comes out of it is again that is a distinction is that gap of okay even if there are these observable differences which are pretty slight when you look at the overall scale of scores mm -hmm. so what I mean, there's there's not enough of an impact there that we need to track people according to their ethnicity. I mean, that's never. I mean, we've got lots of brilliant examples of people from a variety of backgrounds across history. Yeah. Right? And they tend to focus on Western history and colonialism and the um, <clears throat> the takeover of a lot of cultures um, and the um, broad the fact the fact that they brought technology with them. But you know, they got we got gunpowder from the Chinese. We got paper from the Chinese. It was the Arab. Arabic language, oh, algebra. Yeah. You have to be alchemy. really careful now because that conversation has changed a lot. Um, whenever you bring up Chinese people, the, the ethno state guys, they're really crafty with their messaging, has changed from, I don't think white people are the master race. I just think everybody should have their own place. So they'll concede that point really quickly. They'll go, oh yeah, of course, Asian people are smarter than us. And then they'll say something like, but white people have higher creative IQ. And then they'll say something like, I think that <laughs> I do like that Asian people are smarter than us, but Japan has their ethno state. We should have our ethno state. Like they'll, they'll, reach, they'll see that point like really quickly and then go back to how everybody should have their own place blacks in africa whites in america and then chinese over in, in east asia well i looked forward to the mass uh, then immigration of whites back to europe um because that's where the white people came from they didn't come from north america guys you guys are all gonna have to move i don't know yeah. where that's Eastern the, Europe, I don't know if Eastern Europe counts. Does Russia count as white? I don't. I don't know. Yeah, and that's like the the, the <laughs> ultimate irony. And that's always like I always. That's like a quick go to. Although that's usually just to like trigger the the. the whoever I'm talking to is it like it's hilarious how much the definition of white has shifted over time in that it's almost meaningless. So like for instance, I think um, do you know who Tara McCarthy is? Sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she's half Indian. Um, or a guy that I've debated before who is a, like a white ethno state person, like his name is Nick Fuentes and he's 25% mm. Hispanic. Um, and I brought that up once and the, and the, the mental gymnastics were hilarious. Like, you know, like you're 25% Hispanic, Nick, do you think you would qualify for your ethno state? He's like, well, I may be 25% Hispanic. However, I am part of the, um, I think, is it the Castizos? Are they the ones that were predominantly European versus the... Oh, right. So the Spanish, or whatever. Yeah. So and he's the like, Spanish line of. Yeah. Hispanic. So he's like, well, so actually, these guys are like 60% um, European. And if you go back and then combine that with my current, I'm like 91% white. He, he was doing like <laughs> math to like get himself. It was just like a hilariously stupid. Over the line. <laughs> like, your last name is Fuentes. Like, come on, dude. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, there. I'm sure there are interesting psychological studies, but uh, yeah, I, I sort of uh, hesitate to speculate on the mm -hmm. rationale behind that, um, other than obviously wanting an in-group identity. The and the other thing too is when it comes to a white ethno state, I don't understand what's inherently like special about white people because again, when you talk about like some of the arguments being made by people who advocate for um, self-selection into white-only com communes and and the idea of an ethno state, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't see a lot of discussions of the appreciation of Wagner or the the movement in psychology reflected from medieval art into the Renaissance. I don't see a lot of appreciation for Shakespeare. So, and the other thing too is I don't see a respect, I don't see how their ideology can map on to a liberal democracy. It's just fundamentally compa incompatible with the idea that everyone has equality uh, in, in theory, you know, should be equality under the law, but also equality as, as human beings with each other and this is one conversation that i i don't know that there has been a lot of discussion about when i saw that um sargon told um millennial woes in his christmas interview or holiday interview mm -hmm. that if push came to shove and he had to choose between the alt-right and and the sjw's the that regressive what, left sorry yes which, which just wants sort of like people to be treated nice and everyone to be able to fulfill their own potential that whole scary idea um, but it ruins the status quo but he anyway said that he would prefer that the alt-right take their stance um rather than have the sjs and w's in power even if it meant the overthrow of liberal democracy yeah I don't. and you're just like well i don't know how can you possibly be claiming to preserve western culture especially as a british person who has as their cultural heritage thinkers like hume and Locke and other people in the enlightenment um to then 
overthrow, to be willing to overthrow one of the most important intellectual contributions of Western civilization, which is the idea of a representative liberal democracy. I, I am just like flabbergasted. I the, my that. biggest problem with people like Sargon, and this has always been my biggest problem with people like Sargon, is I, I very legitimately, and I, and I would even defend this in argument, I don't think that Sargon is racist, and I don't even think he's necessarily hateful towards any group of people. I just think he's really, really stupid. And this has been my big complaint with a lot of these people is like, I don't even like the phrase useful idiot because it doesn't do justice to the depths of stupidity that some of these people exhibit when they talk about some of these issues. Like when I, like when I hear people say like postmodernist uh, Marxists and shit, and it's oh, like, uh, like <laughs> what does that even mean? You know, yes, like, exactly. Or, or like every like, um, Jesus Christ, like just getting um, I, there was like some I don't I don't think this was VidCon, I think it was a different thing, but where Sargon was on stage talking about feminism with some guy, and the guy was like, "What is feminism, Sargon?" And he's like, uh, "I what, did he I, something he said something about cultural Marxism? I'm pretty sure, like in his definition of feminism." And it's like, "What does this even mean, dude? Like, do, do you really think that like most people that are advocating for these things are trying to overthrow society and like destroy the white man and shit?" Like, uh it is interesting the extent to which I, I call them you know, not just me, but you know, status quo warriors. The the lengths they'll go to sort of demonize people who basically just want the same kind of um, opportunities that uh, a sort of cis white male born into, you know, anything above poverty has access to, which includes like going to work and not being sexually harassed or going into a shop and not being followed because of the color of your skin or pulled over by the police uh -huh. or um, being con um, asked for your ID because your last name is Spanish. Yeah. White guys don't experience that. And they don't have any of those barriers as they go through their and, and everyone else just wants that too. They want to have a, a Hispanic last name and not assumed to be um, somehow, you know, there in the country illegally. Or to, you know, be able to walk down a street Just at got night your and Christmas not have hoodie to you know, in the worry mail. about Looks being sexually buddy. assaulted. Guys don't you guys might be worried about being mugged, but you're not worried about being raped when you go sure. down the street. I would like that too. I would love to worry about just being mugged. <laughs> one way that I try to phrase this to people, because um, one thing that I think is really hard for people to understand, um, for minorities or for women to understand, is that you have, there are things about you, and the, the way that I always phrase this is by insults, is that if I walk into a room and there is like a straight white guy, there's not really any insult that you can use against them that's like personal that really works there's nothing that you can really say um whereas like if i'm in a room with an indian i there's a million things that you know you can make fun of for indians for black people for women there's a million go-to jokes that are personal that are targeted towards your gender but for somebody like a straight white guy there's not really anything that you can really say that, that to, to like target anything about their character because it's kind of like the assumed default um and i think one of the issues that um, white people have or white men especially i say straight white men i'm sounding like an sjw but like for straight white men okay <laughs> one of the issues is that like you'd never have an experience where you can't do something because of something that's intrinsic to you. Like if you're a straight white guy, there's not really anything that you can't do except for maybe some things that would be considered feminine. But other than that, like there's not, and even that that's because women suck and you don't want to do anything feminine <laughs> like that. Like that, that's the given explanation, you know, um, there's not really anything you've ever been told that you can't do because you're a straight white guy. You've never seen a message in media, um, either overtly or subtly. You've never seen, um, you know, a teacher tell you, a parent tell you, someone in society tell you a police officer treat you a certain way there's never like a negative there's never a con to being like a straight white guy so it's really hard to understand what it's like to live with like things that are almost intrinsic or that are intrinsic to your character that end up being cons in some certain situations so it's a really hard thing for people to empathize with if they've never experienced it before i think i saw a comedian a winner of a canadian comedy festival from this year mm -hmm. who was joking about um his straight friends who don't want to go to gay bars like, well, I don't want to go to the gay bar because, you know, I don't want to get hit on by guys. And like, well, now you know what it's like to be a woman at every bar. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Or outside um, of every bar or in every video game or in yeah. every coworker environment. Yeah. yeah. And so there are, I think, these moments of displacement <sighs> now because we have more communities where maybe because they wouldn't be the majority there, not being straight would be putting yeah. them in the minority status, where they would be very aware of the fact that they were a minority, maybe for the first time in their lives. Mm -hmm. I remember myself, because I grew up in Lily White, Wisconsin, in rural Wisconsin, where we didn't have, I think we had three black students in a school of 1,200 when I went to high school. Mm -hmm. I mean, white. 
And I went to a conference on racial equality out in Philadelphia. And it was me and like um, the this girl who was a socialist <laughs> who had flown out. And we were the t- we were two white girls and it was everybody else was um, of African descent. Mm-hmm. I don't know from Jamaica or whatever. But uh, and that was the first time in my life where I walked into the room and I wasn't the majority. Yeah. And that moment stuck with me for the rest of my life because it was so profound. But for people who are people of color that's their daily experience is you know to walk in a room and have a sea of of white faces or mostly white faces maybe a couple of people of color but again that that displacement um i think those moments for majority populations are are hard to come by especially when you don't live in a multicultural area yeah this is um go- going back to uh, kind of related to that this is one of the things that angered me the most that i would like kill maybe not kill but like come very close to killing dave rubin for saying that it irritated me so much are you familiar with the whole national anthem fiasco in the united states where the players the are, kneeling yeah the kneeling the oh kneeling my thing. god yeah. yeah the kneeling thing um it was when dave rubin this was like oh god I can't talk to people like you too much because I come off sounding very SJWS, but that's okay. I like the serve a joke. <laughs> um, there, there was this where Dave Rubin said it was the whitest thing I'd ever heard in my entire life having to do with the black people protesting the national anthem is when he said, you know, I don't want politics and everything. Sometimes I just want to be able to take a step back and enjoy the game. And it's like, man, isn't that nice that you can just put these issues to the side and never have to deal with them in your life at all and just step back yeah. and enjoy something? That's real. That's that's the beauty of being a white guy in America. Like you never have to worry about that. That's so nice, Dave Rubin. Wouldn't it be nice if everybody could do that? Like the idea of like saying that to a black dude, like, listen, dude, like, can you just like chill with the fucking black shit for like a little bit? Like, I just want to enjoy like a fucking game. It's like, oh yeah. So it's nice that you could take that step back and not have to worry about it ever, you know? Ugh. And the other thing, too, they could have taken this as an amazing expression of the free, of free expression people are allowed in America. Mm-hmm. That a silent protest that speaks to um, the death of members of, uh, of an American community is being um, taken on by people who are very privileged in that community, acknowledging that their voices can be used to raise awareness and do some good. Yeah. What a more powerful statement of free speech is there? I don't know. But as you say, because it's for a progressive cause, you know, if this had been, um, you know, a, more of a right wing issue of veterans or something, yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm sure that that would have been considered patriotic sure. as a form of protest to want a better America yeah. for, let's say, wounded veterans sure. and, and that's the problem it's not about the principles it's very situational their ethics and mm-hmm. and um you know what is what will my audience think you know what is what is the other echo part of the echo chamber i don't want to be out of step with alex jones <laughs> yeah there's so much um <laughs> there's just so many stupid memes there's just it's like that issue was just so insanely unbelievable like what how, how are you supposed to protest like like that's like a good question like what is the acceptable way for a black person to protest like if mm. kneeling at the national anthem makes you this fucking outraged like jesus christ like what, what are you supposed to do and then my favorite thing about trump being elected arguably one of the only positives is that whenever people say like well i don't care about their opinions on politics you know they're just celebrities or they're just athletes or whatever it's like dude trump was a reality tv star and you elected him as president like we can talk about celebrity opinions on politics now because you elected one to the white house Right, you were the one that broke the dam. Yeah, like you can't, you can't really, you can't. This is kind of untenable ground at this point. Uh. And the fact is, you know, when it comes to that, I mean, part of the reason that they were kneeling was because it, it, they did have their celebrity, and they were using it in a positive way, and not sort of like you know, Golden Globes victory uh, speech, sort of being as the music is being played off, virtue signaling kind mm-hmm. of way, but in a very subtle, silent, and and I don't know if you know the history of the kneeling oh, but my yeah. understanding is that it was a soldier mm-hmm. who because uh, kaepernick or somebody else was sitting and they said you know kneel instead because that's what they do in front of the yeah. graves of their fallen um their fellow soldiers so it was actually it was something worked out with somebody in the military mm-hmm. to find a respectful respectful media, middle ground between free speech and dignity yeah but the military shit doesn't matter because because ah, uh, because they're what you said earlier. Their ethics are so situational. Yeah. Um, the the um. Oh God, what was I? I just had two things in my head. One was um Trump. Oh, like the. I, there are so many points. Um, I don't. Were you living in America? You weren't during the Republican nomination cycle. 
Thank God, no. But I am a political scientist, and so I watched it like a soap opera. So I did yeah. videos on it, okay. and I followed the polls, and I was obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Then you must have went through the same thing, unless you're like, unless you could see the fucking future. There were so many moments where Trump said something, and I was like, "That's it, dude. He's totally done." Um, in the nomination cycle, one of those moments was when he attacked McCain, and it's like Republicans love soldiers. There is no way that Trump is really going to get by telling McCain he's a loser for being a prisoner of war. Not McCain, the guy that can't raise his arms above his head because his, because his shoulders were broken so many times in like Vietnam, like prisoner of war camps. There's no way that he'll actually. And he like walks away from all of these totally unscathed. Um, and he did it with the uh, with the with the one family. Um, oh fuck, the family of the soldier that had died. Do you remember what I'm talking yeah, the, about? Yeah, the Khan, the Khan family. Yeah, 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 the Khan family. Yeah, and he did it there too. The, like the, the huge disrespect for military related shit. So like it seems like yeah, it seems like everything is just super situational. Like Republicans fucking will will bend their morals for whatever the fuck they want. Um my mom is a crazy, crazy, crazy Republican. I love her to death because um, they're my parents and they raised me. But, like, my mom is an insanely hardcore Republican. I remember that when I was growing up – I'm 29 now. I remember that when I was growing up, when my mom would talk about Bill Clinton and the whole Monica Lewinsky thing, she would cry because my mom was in the Air Force. And she said, that stuff that Bill Clinton did to women, that rolls down, okay? The president is the commander-in-chief. When the president treats women like that, everybody in the military treats women like that. And she would be brought to tears explaining this to me about how horrible this was. And she's on the on the Trump train. And when the when the grab him by the pussy tape leaked, you know, her defense of Trump was, well, Stevie, you say really rude things on your stream sometimes. And, you know, that's just guys being guys. I was like, are you fuck? First of all, mom, I'm not running for president of the United States. I think the qualifications are a little bit. The expectation should be different. And secondly, like, just lock her around. Uh. It, and with Alabama, you saw there was a preacher who was on AM Joy. And they were asking about the character of Roy Moore. And the guy's defense was, well, God uses the, you know, uses sinners to make his change in the world. If you look at David, David wasn't that great of a man, but he did great things through the power of God. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, seriously, you're going to compare Roy Moore to David? That's, that's where we're going. <laughs> did you watch the Vice? <laughs> there, there was no, that, that Vice, was um, uh, the, the poll, um, the focus group or whatever that the guy asked questions to. In Alabama? Maybe, uh, it, it was the one where the quote came where the guy was like, you know, 40 years in Alabama, you know. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 14, you, my grandmother got married when she was 15. You're like. 13, I think he said. But yeah, holy oh, shit. Yeah. You're like, you know what? Slavery used to be legal too. It didn't make it right. Yeah. It didn't make it right. And yeah, the excuses. It, it is, but this is um, unfortunately, it's it's our psychology. This and we're not up against. You know, we're not reasoning beings. Yeah. As one of my colleagues likes to say, you know, we emote and then we rationalize. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of where we get our political arguments from. Is we have a feeling about what things ought to be like, and then we argue from what we think it should be to say that's what you know it is, and, and we, it always has been, or it was, and we should go back to it. Mm -hmm. This is um, this is something that this is kind of what drives me to do uh, my confrontational stuff. I'm very con when I say confrontational, I mean like I do like a lot of debate, um, engaging the opposition kind of thing. One thing that, um, and I guess I'm kind of curious, so I can get your take on this. One thing that it seems to me that happened. Um, is it seems like in the um, in like so when we talk about civil rights in the 50s 60s and even before that and, and even to some extent after that we had huge conversations in the United States about race so questions like should black people be allowed to access the same institution as white people are black people equal to white right, white people do they deserve equal rights these are questions that were on the forefront of people's minds that we wrestled with and we had to, we had to have answers for them because these were things that were changing um, and it feels like back then, like because they were at the forefront of kind of like the public discourse, because these were values that were changing, people had to be able to defend the change in these values. Why are black people endowed with equal rights as white people? You know, why should black people be allowed equal access to institutions? It seems like along the way, we kind of stopped justifying those things and we kind of took them for granted and that like, oh, well, you know, of course women and men should be treated equally or, you know, minorities should, you know, strive for equal access to an equal opportunity as non-minority figures. 
And it seems like what happened is over the past like 10 years, there's been like this resurgence of people that are kind of like questioning these core concepts that, that seem to be unjustified. And now nobody seems to have an answer for why they're important. That's like the thing that I kind of notice going on now is that when somebody asks a question like, um, like for instance, Richard Spencer, when he says, well, black people benefited from slavery, all people can do is like act incredulous and they don't really have like a defense for it. Like, well, okay, well, why is what he said wrong? And that's kind of what's driven me so much to engage with opposition on a lot of these topics. I appreciate your opposition. I think someone had a, a sort of painted an image of you in that uh, Kumite stream with like you, like it, like sort of in a video game battling off four. Attacks. Yeah, I try not to get too like circle jerk here, like because my ego <laughs> yeah. will grow to dangerous levels. Well, no, but, <laughs> I mean, and I'm not saying that I agree with every single thing you said, but I mm -hmm. think, and of course, occasionally you threw in a, a hominem, an odd hominem back too, which I oh, can yeah. forget. Hardcore, yeah. So I'm not spreading. saying you were a saint, you know, but you did always try to come back to the points and the arguments and the public policies and the outcomes and the ultimate goal of your thinking, not just argue the minutia of this point, yes or no. Um, but to your point, I think in some ways there's a line in, from a, a TV show called I, Claudius, two actors are talking about the theater when they were growing up and now it's just corrupt and parts go to friends and, and someone says, you know, the theater isn't what it was and his friend says, and you know what else, it never was mm -hmm. what it was. I think that conversation is a little bit, it never was what it was. If From a, a political ideology standpoint, there was a really good piece, um, a four-part piece that appeared, I think, in Salon, where the author made a very convincing argument that you can draw a line in the ideology from the Tea Party back to the people who resisted civil rights, back to Jim Crow, back to the Civil War. And that it's not that. So what happened is, you're right, we did have a conversation nationally about the fundamental humanity of, of our citizens African of African descent. And in the law, the the progressive side won. Mm -hmm. However, the communities that stood in opposition, they never went away. Yeah. They just got a little quiet. It, and then they became the moral majority. Mm -hmm. And then they became, you know, the the whatever Newt Gingrich's contract with America and they became part of Ross Perot's movement and then they become part of the Tea Party movement. So I think it's that we're the internet has provided us as a society with something we never had before. That conversation you referred to happening in the 60s, it didn't really happen in the way it's, things talk, are talked about now. It was hap um, The conversations happened in the media or they happened <clears throat> locally. Mm -hmm. And if you lived in a, a predominantly white state that wasn't affected by segregation, of course you could take the lofty aim of people being integrated because it didn't cost you anything. It wasn't part of your life, right? Mm -hmm. So that became, you're right, the national norm. But that resistance the anti-PC crowd, as we would probably call them now, has always been there. And the internet, because it is democratic, has given a lot of people with very anti-democratic views, in my opinion, platforms that they never had access to before, and networking opportunities uh. that they didn't have access to before. And so what we're seeing, actually, as you were talking about, we're seeing the unmasking. People are pulling off their hoods. They've always been there. They've just been under their hoods until now. Yeah. That's my take. On that's it. like a really huge thing that I try to get across to people that I run into people that don't seem to realize that is that like I like Trump himself is not really a problem. It's the idea that there were this many people in the United States willing to vote for him. And that's kind of where my big um I I have had a, actually a pretty big split in my community recently because there are a lot of people that um uh, well, on the left, there are a lot of people that make this claim that like, well, no, you should never talk to these people. You don't need to platform these ideologies. You should never engage with these people. And it's like in the United States, um, whether you want to admit it or not, in the United States, liberal or left-leaning views have been the predominant ones for the past, you know, decade and a half at least. Like, if you're in a workplace, you can't speak out against minorities or women. You know, if you look at messages coming from Hollywood, from, from pretty much all the mainstream media, say, like Fox News or talk radio, left-leaning viewpoints are the only ones that you really can express without getting crucified for it. But the problem, I think, is that we all kind of bullshitted ourselves into believing that if we just did that long enough, that everybody eventually was on board. And then when Trump rolled around, I think it was a big wake-up call where it's like, oh, well, hold on, holy shit, half the country is still thinking a totally fucking different thing, but we never engaged with it, we never had any idea it was there, and we kind of swept it under the rug and pretended it didn't exist and kind of hoped it would go away. After the Second World War, uh -huh. uh, psychology took up this issue of authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. And you might be very familiar with maybe because of your study of politics and and um, My history is so bad. But, but and the Milgram. The oh, Milgram yeah, I'm, I'm very much familiar with it. 
mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Where they had these tests of authority because mm-hmm. there was this question, what was it about the German people that made them so susceptible to Hitler? What was it about the culture or yeah. their psychology? Are they evil people them- or what would it take for right. somebody to do this? Yeah. And what we found is that um, quite a lot of number of people in the population are willing to submit to authority. Mm-hmm. And we also know just from looking at political attitudes that, you know, some people are, are attracted to a more strong man, authoritarian type of figure. They feel more secure in that kind of um, situation. Look at Putin. Um, even though there's a lot of op- opposition to Putin, there's a lot of people who support Putin in Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are people who support dictators all over the world. So why would America be special? Why wouldn't we have an element that was basically a, an underbelly of fascism that given an economic condition and a demagogue, those two things coming together um, in the sort of perfect storm wouldn't be a threat to our liberal democracy. I think the problem is we didn't think that this is a possibility. And yet here we are in the 21st century having what's basically debates with, with fascists again about fundamental human equality. Yeah. The, um, this has actually been like the – hinting at that, this has been the number one thing that I've noticed w- between every person – I think every person that, that massively disagrees with my policy positions, this has been the one running theme that I wish I could fucking eradicate from people's minds is this cancerous concept of free will and agency. It is like the number one detriment to understanding anything about how reality works in my opinion when it comes to discussing politics and in, in past that even more things with people. Um, this idea that people are these like free agents that make decisions in vacuums is just the worst concept ever and if somebody believes it they will never agree with any type of position that's rooted in any type of data or or, or fact-based analysis um and, and I try to bring this up over and over again. Like, we, 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 like you can run these like really predictable experiments. Things like I think I want to say the Milgram experiment usually runs with isn't it seventy percent plus that will will go to the final shock. Yep. It, it, it's an well, abs- I mean, when they could still do it because it's yeah. unethical to think you're killing people. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I um, th- I, haven't they found ways to rerun it? Where, where if you do the debriefing at the end or whatever, I know it's been ran more than the original time, at least, right? Yeah, I don't know in what countries or what their sure. ethical. Yeah, but because yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not a psychologist, yeah, I'm yeah. a political scientist. Um, so, but <laughs> but, it's but like, yeah, continuing. A- a- every single piece of data we've ever uncovered in all the history of anything having to do with psychology, anything having to do with a- anthropology, population studies, everything usually points to the fact, and even current data points that people put in predictable scenarios will make predictable choices. Like if you look at cr- if you look at everything, like there are always distributions that are higher in certain places. If you look at crime, it's not like every Every single person in the United States has the propensity to, to, to deal meth at, at the same level as any other person. You know, usually there are there are, are indicators, you know, that like, well, if a person is born in this kind of a city to this kind of a family with this kind of environment, they usually but people like never acknowledge that. That 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 whole concept of agency is like the number one brain rot that I run into when trying to have these conversations with people. Again, we run up against the problem of our own psychology. Uh, I don't know. You would probably really enjoy the series, and maybe people who are enjoying this conversation would as well. The Dr. Paul Bloom, who teaches out of Yale, has an introduction to psychology course on YouTube, and it's also available for podcasts, sort of download. Highly recommend it. One of the things he talks about in there is uh, that we have a psychological disposition to attribute failure yeah. to other people as individuals, whereas we look at our circumstances. Mm-hmm. So I think it's the fun- audience- fundamental misattribution bias, I think is what it's yeah. called. Yeah. You're really good. See, you like, like I, I have to look up a lot of fun to talk to. I have to look up all these biases so that I don't fall into myself. I took an AP psych class in high school and it was like the best oh, thing right. I'd ever taken in my entire life. I we, love psychology. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But, but sorry, go ahead. Yeah. But to explain for people in your audience who might not know, the fundamental um, misattribution or attribution error goes like this. Two people do have a midterm, and one person, they both do very poorly. You ask the person, why did your friend over there you know, fail their midterm? They'll say, well, they were out partying all this week, and they didn't spend enough time studying, and I'm pretty sure they you know, were hungover when they came to class today. They failed their test because of their poor preparation, mm-hmm. um, because they're a bad person. They're just lazy. They're not disciplined. And then you ask, well, why did you do poorly on your exam? Like, well, I was sick this week. It was beyond my control. This thing happened to me. It was beyond Mm -hmm. my control. So the kind of empathetic context context that we're willing to give ourselves in terms of why we might fail, we aren't willing to extend that um, naturally. It's not our natural disposition. We have to learn 
yeah. about structure and agency. And that's a difference that we talk about in political science is the structure and agency mm -hmm. issue. And that kind of comes down to, like you were talking about agency and free will. For instance, the example that if people can just go down to the DMV, they should have no barrier to vote. <laughs> oh, God, the Tonka argument. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I was laughing my ass off at how poor that argument was. Anyway. Well, because like, it's true, like, but it's so <laughs> stupid. That's so it's stupid. It's so the point. Like, it's anybody right now has the ability to go down and buy the right stocks to become a billionaire tomorrow. If you did the right options trading with the correct leveraging, you could be a billionaire in, like, a day or two if you, if you were really... But, like, that's so stupid. <laughs> like... Uh. Yeah. So, you know, but now if you're going to travel to the DMV, you're going to travel there, but you're not going to take into account the fact that you're going to obey all the traffic signs on your way down there. And you're probably going to be polite in terms of giving people way or, um, you know, allowing people yielding. You know, there's a whole bunch of informal practices that will influence your journey, right? Those are kind of like state structures that we don't even think about in our life. We just sort of internalize them. Mm -hmm. And then there are like real barriers. For instance, you know, you don't have a car and the DMV is on the other side of town and you've got to take two buses and change, um, you know, to, um, in order to get there. And it's going to take you an hour and 15 minutes each way um, every single day. And, and you, you work during the week, so you can't go on the weekends. Yeah, and That's DMV hours are literally like fucking nine to four or some stupid shit. Right. Ugh, yeah. You know, I was thinking about it. The DMV where my um, some of my family live, you, if you don't have a car, you can't get there because there isn't a bus stop mm -hmm. that goes out to the DMV. What do you do? So anyway, and, and so those kind of situational barriers, as you say, those aren't ever taken into account. It's always this hyper agency. People are failures because they choose to fail. Or if people have setbacks, they, they somehow have perfect autonomy to overcome their situations like sexual harassment in the workplace. Yeah. The, the biggest problem with that, the, the, the huge barrier to that is that um, and I, I compare this to talking to – are you religious? No, I'm an atheist. Uh, yeah, okay, but so I'm a recovering Catholic. Oh, oh, cool. I was Catholic, too. I went to a Jesuit high school. <laughs> um, oh, I didn't have that much of a Catholic. Yeah. Well, the Jesuit high course. school was actually way better than the Catholic grade school. The Catholic grade, yeah, for sure. Um, Jesuits seem to be a lot more chill than, than the more extremist. Yeah, I have to say, I've heard, they seem to be the best Catholics. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, um, I, I kind of compare this High to, compliments like... compliments from atheists. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. Um, when you look at, like, if you look at somebody who's, like, 50 or 60 years old, the chances of this kind of a person becoming an atheist are very very slim because in order to do it they have to like admit that they were wrong for so much of their life and, and it's like a fundamental change of like how you view the whole world and like to walk back on that after so many decades is so hard i view the um the agency argument as being kind of similar because if you're in your 20s if like especially because like and, and I'm, I'm really rough on this on screen but like if you're 25 and you were born in a middle class family and you went to a good school you had a mom that stayed at home and helped you with your homework or a dad that stayed at home and helped you with your homework and you went to college and you got your four-year degree and you got a decent job what you're basically telling people like this when, when you talk about how agency is a bunch of bullshit is they have to start disregarding a whole bunch of their personal achievement and that's really hard for a lot of people to do i think I think you're right. I mean, that's not to say they didn't work hard. You know, I, I was the first person in my family to go to college. Mm -hmm. I worked my way through my undergraduate degree. I worked my way through my master's. I worked my way through my PhD. I ended, still ended up with tons of debt, but it was the right choice, and I wouldn't have made any other. That being said, you know, I did have – I grew up in, a, in an area that had really good property taxes, so the schools I went to – we're good. I was bused to school at taxpayer expense because I live, you know, hell and gone from from the city. Mm -hmm. um, the the public. I went to public uh, university that was, uh, I think, seventy percent funded by the taxpayers, mm -hmm. and I uh, and I was also I got federally subsidized student loans. Uh, of course, I didn't do it myself. Yeah. You know, um, that's well, not to say I didn't work hard, well, but I even had a going, lot of advantages. Even going further than that is like, and this is the, the the group of people that pisses me off the most is that there will be people that will criticize people that take advantage of government money while their mom and dad will take care of everything until they're like into their mid or late twenties, where, where where they'll say they're like, well, you shouldn't need welfare from the government, but they have like mommy and daddy welfare, and they're not even cognizant of that throughout like their mid twenties. Right. I mean, I think that you can stay on your parents' insurance now until you're 26. 26. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could have kids, you know, <laughs> a couple of kids and a mortgage by the time you're 26 if, you know, you're quite ambitious and that's what you want to do in your life. Um, yeah. So for me, like that seems, um, I mean, uh, people are going to be mad at me. I mean, I do think it, sh it should probably go down to like 23 or 24 because I think four years, 22 when you get out of college or so, two years to get on your feet and get a, a, get a good uh, job. But hopefully with 
um, well, the, fixing the healthcare system would be a better solution, but I'm getting off topic. Oh, we're um, fixing it. We just got yeah. rid of the mandate, so we're going back to whatever we had before. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> Emergency uh, room. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the, this, um, the, the, the way that people kind of, again, discount the, the leg up mm-hmm. that they had, um, only seeing their own work. I mean, yeah. Sargon says that he works really hard. You know, like he was complaining when all his videos got demonetized. He had to spend three hours going through his back catalog and clicking to have his videos reviewed. And he's like, oh, this is such a hard day at work. Um, you know, and I'm sure he does feel like he works really hard. But compared to other people, they would probably not see that as very hard work. And mm-hmm. yet he makes a very good income. Um, and that's sort of like the Dire Straits song, you know, get your money for nothing and your chicks for free. Yeah. Um, just <laughs> um and yet he will feel very entitled to every penny he's earned. Mm-hmm. And I, again, this I think comes down to, like you said, some, some fundamental psychology that you have to be shown the psychological, the psychological pattern not through you, like you're doing this thing, right? But hey, these studies show that this is the thing and it sounds like this is what you're doing uh, to try to kind of get people to step out of. It's, I, God, I wish if it he, was that easy. I've had so many conversations <laughs> that just blow my no, fucking have. mind. Have you? There's like um, it, it it would be like you 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 you're you're talking about like uh like um, you, you, have you ever played like a trading card game like a Magic the Gathering or Hearthstone or? Oh yeah, yeah. I was totally a nerd. Okay, so, so it's Magic back it, in the day. Like, in the it's 90s. like it's like. If somebody asks you, like, what are the chances of drawing a card or, or doing a thing in a particular thing, and you go through, like, okay, well, you know, you weigh this odd, it consists odd, and this, and they're like, no, 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 no. The chances are 50%. It either happens or it doesn't. It's like that <laughs> response to everything. Like, I've had so many conversations with people where I'm like, okay, will you agree then? Okay, so, like, first of all, we can agree that there's stickiness at the ends, right? That really rich people tend to be really w- rich. Lowest quintile people tend to be pretty poor. And he'll be like, yeah, sure. And I'm like, okay, well, poor people tend to commit crime over rich people. I'm like, yeah, sure. And it's like, okay, people in broken families tend to be criminals more than people in, in whole families. Yeah, sure. It's like, okay, well, then why can't you see that there's, like, a higher chance of people in, in these situations? of committing crime for, and they're like well at the end of the day they make the choice and it's like <laughs> well, okay well what uh, yeah you can yeah you can lead an anti to logic but you can't make them think holy shit it's like ah uh, the 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 vo- oh man that Tonka dude did you did you have the misfortune of having to listen to that entire thing or did you just go through parts of it or I listen I've actually listened to quite a lot of Tonka because of Kraut game. Uh, he's been covering it quite a lot. I'll never. And to be I honest, did, uh. when he's in his, you know, cis white male safe space of his channel, he can be pretty chill. He, he, you know, he jokes around and things. Um, I'm sure he would hate me with a, a deep passion if he ever knew who I was. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, in, and so I ended up, because I do listen, you know, I ended up listening to quite a lot of that. I think, um, yes, I think I got about, about two hours Sure. Did you get listen to the part where he was trying to convince me that the the North Carolina voter ID thing isn't racist? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I got through. Yes, that was insane. Normally, when people bring up stuff like that, I love doing voter ID because it makes me look good because it's a slam dunk argument. It's too easy. It's way easy. That's a gimme. When you bring up voter ID, it's obvious that you don't know what you're talking about, so I can just slam dunk this. But like, oh my god, he was impervious to all logic. (laughs) It was impossible. Well, I was. What was the best part for me? Was when Andy read the thing you had provided, and he <laughs> was convinced. He's good. like, "Hey, it, it does say it, it. It says what he says. It says." And then you had to ask Andy to explain the exact same thing you had just said to Tonka, but he wouldn't believe it coming from you. Mm-hmm. But he would believe it coming, and it reminded me of something. And I was thinking, "What was this? What is it? This, this is reminding me of." And I've tracked it down. It's the scene in Hot Fuzz where Simon Pegg and Nick Frost as long as with another officer have to go out to this guy with a really, really thick accents farm. Yeah. And they have to say the same thing four different times in order for it to be translated. Wait, that's what it felt like. Did you link this to me? I think I put it on Twitter because maybe somebody put it in there. Oh, okay. You might, yeah. Cause somebody just linked this to me like today. So that was going to be really, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It might've been you that tweeted it. I mean, something. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, wow, that's exactly what that scene was. It was like destiny saying to Andy, Andy, just explain the exact same thing I said to Tonka. Cause <laughs> he will hear you. He won't hear me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm I'm actually really glad you brought up the Tonka thing. One of the reasons why... Are you familiar with No Bullshit? Do you know who that guy is? 
I did see your, inter- I saw the nightmare of the, your um, interaction, at least one of them, because there were two, right? But I know sure. I watched one for quite a long time and just admired, you had like the patience of St. Francis, I swear. Somehow, yeah. <laughs> the, um, was it, was it one of, was it the incest conversation or was it something different? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it was yeah, the that wasn't, yeah. Um, I find that's like a really good like litmus test for, are you capable of like objectively evaluating your moral system or something or, or, or like having an argument? It seems to be like a good testing ground for that. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned the thing about Tonka because I noticed that for a lot of these guys, that when they put together their videos, like I can pick out like a million reasons why this video is bullshit, but it contains enough buzzwords and enough like internal rigor that it, I could see why people would listen to these videos and think that people know what they're talking about. If you watch No Bullshit's videos, for the most part, uh, if you if you're not too critical they they sound okay like you can understand where he's coming from and whatnot but like if you if you start to dig into it it's like okay well there's a lot of problems with this video and from the sounds of it i've never seen anything from tonka before but from the sounds of it tonka might be similar this is another reason why i like confronting these people in a live environment is because it gives me a, a, the ability to showcase it. like okay like this guy's method of thinking is really fucking flawed he cannot put together ideas like in a coherent manner and you tried like you were leading him down the garden path you were putting out all the pieces and he was just standing there like yeah and, or he would throw an ad hominem up and it was yeah it, and then he went off into the corner and sulked for a while yeah. so that was also kind of interesting but you're right it was the same thing with no bullshit i mean he was he was basically having a verbal temper tantrum mm-hmm. because he refused to acknowledge as you say you know we can all have a um innate revulsion to the notion of incest. I don't think it's something that has to be morally justified for us to have a moral revulsion to it, right? This is why you say it's a good testing ground, because it shows whether or not you can say, okay, I'm revolted by this notion. I don't think it's right. But when we look at what we consider to be our moral frameworks, like consenting adults and prevention of harm and all the other things, why would, what, is there an argument you can make? And when that gap is discovered, I think what they leap to is saying, you're saying that it, there shouldn't be a revulsion, and yeah. you're not saying that at all. You're just saying, look, the morality here is an aberration, because normally our moral conclusions sort of uh, fit with our moral reactions. Mm-hmm. Are you, um, just curious, are you a vegan? No. Oh, shit, okay. That's another argument yeah. that is... Um... Whew, that's a that's a really hard one to have from the meat eating perspective. I would feel more. I'm I'm. I probably shouldn't be, but I, I eat meat. But I probably would have an easier time arguing the vegan side of things. Um, I find that. Oh like, yeah, they have the better arguments. Oh, they yeah. definitely have the better arguments. Yeah. I'm just lazy, and I live in Germany where we have sausage. Sure, so yeah. and kebabs, right? <laughs> um, yes, kebabs are everywhere. The um that this goes back to kind of what I said earlier, and um that it bothers me that people walk around with so many unjustified positions. That's scary to me. Um, not because of like intellectual integrity, you know, blah blah blah. But an unjustified position has changed quite easily. I think. Um, all of my positions are are pretty well justified. Anything that I feel strongly about, such that like if you want to change my opinion on it, we're gonna to have to go back and we're gonna to have to have a really deep conversation about like my underlying rationale for believing things. But if, I feel like if you're if you're um, if all of your opinions are unjustified, that anybody that presents a compelling enough narrative or, or even a, a compelling enough result or end end point can very easily change whatever it is you believe. That maybe you think you know like okay, well black and white people should have equal rights. Yeah, that sounds good. But then when when it, when somebody who looks very nice and is very well spoken and very funny you know somebody like richard spencer comes up and starts talking about why a white ethnostate should exist all of a sudden you, you have your unchallenged your unjustified ethical position is finally being spoken to by another person and it's like oh well shit everything he's saying sounds really fucking good um why the fuck do i even think this original thing it becomes so much easier to hop over to like a cancerous idea i think i shouldn't say cancerous but it's like an idea that's that is really really um bad moral justifications for it Part of the problem that came out of the fascination with science, Mm -hmm. the the so-called skeptic community that grew up debunking creationists, was that they could recite the science, but they didn't understand the method of deriving the knowledge. They didn't understand the philosophy behind it. They just sort of like, this is science, we can observe it, it's been tested, therefore it's true. Not that it's truth, but it's true. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and when you have to um, actually question, like, how do you derive truth, 
and what are your first principles? Why are those your first principles? How do they then lead on to other conclusions that you might not have anticipated or expected or even wanted? Yeah. Um, that's a whole different conversation. And so because they could recite the science and they had faith in the method, um, they never really had an opportunity to engage in the critical thinking skills that mm. actually produced our ability to have confidence in our scientific conclusions. Yep. And that's like, um, I get this accusation over and over again. And I did it to Tonka. I don't know if you heard it when Tonka was saying, you trick people into doing this. And I kept asking for an example. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. basically, my the way that I argue against people that seem to have fucking stupid normative positions is what I do is you say a certain thing. So what I try to do is I try to extract that into some syllogistic form, and then I'll plug in something else to test for consistency. Consistency. That's that's like ninety nine percent of my argumentation. Somebody says like, um, I don't think black people um, should be able to do shit in society, um, you know, because they made bad choices. Like, okay, so you think that um, if, if somebody makes a bad choice or whatever, there should be no recourse for them in society. Okay, what if you're a poor white person and let's say you live in a town and the industry leaves for some reason? Do you think these people should just be left to rot? And then all of a sudden they're like, oh well, no, wait, well hold on, no, 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 that's totally different. And then they're like, why are you putting my words in my mouth? Like I never meant there said that at all. You know, I, I run into that a lot with people. I was like, okay, well, I was just testing your initial position to see if your your, your logic, your form of thinking actually held true. Um, I don't know if this is because like, I did a decent amount of math in high school, but like conclusions are really kind of worthless compared to the thought process. Um, and once you move on from even fucking algebra, like that becomes like really obvious, at least in a math class, right? That your, your final answer is worth, on a 10 point problem, the, the answer might be worth like two or three points, but like the, the process that you get there is the most important thing. And if you do a wrong process or, or fuck up part of the middle end and you actually get the right answer, you might not even get half credit on the, on the, on the answer. Um, and a lot of people don't seem to understand that, that the thought process is important important because it can lead you to really scary conclusions in the future, right? It's all about having predictive power to, to make good choices in the future, not just what is your conclusion now. There is a school of thought in political science that I don't hold to entirely, mm -hmm. but I think the author of it was Zaller, and it's something like to do with public opinion. And, and the fact is that a lot of people hold um, opinions that if you bring them down to their core value are in contradiction, like people who support the death penalty and oppose abortion. Um, you know, and one will say you're preserving life in the case of the abortion, and the other one is it's a justifiable homicide. Um, although, but if you really wanted to preserve life, that was your core argument. You would should also be against a death penalty. Sure. Um, and you're right; a lot of people hold a mis mismatch of of opinions and attitudes. And your process is an opportunity if people decide to take it mm -hmm. to explore that process. But I think most of them don't because they have very strongly held opinions although they're not grounded in very strong values yeah. you know, consist consistently. Yeah, I think that's the difference between um, where do you start? It, fuck, I don't know the path. It's like the, the, the last thing is applied ethics. I think before that is meta ethics and before that is something, what is that? Oh, that I don't know. Fuck. I didn't do philosophy. Oh, I dated yeah, philosophers. Okay. But... <laughs> there, there's like a, there's like the starting position and then you get like the, the meta ethic position and then you get to like the applied ethics or whatever. And it seems like people only have like the final position and nothing before then has ever thought about, you know? You know, I, I think that you, what you do is really good. Um, and you're willing to go into the lion's den. The other thing is, you know, listening to Tonka actually was watching him before I came onto this stream mm -hmm. is that he doesn't really care about facts or evidence or the debate. He, he actually oh, said that, you know, yeah. he just wants to sort of have an argument and yell at people. And, and there's a link there, I think, between you know, like the sort of wrestling soap operas and the drama of, you know, sort of men sort of bellowing at each other like mm -hmm. oxen pawing at the ground and this sort of display of masculinity where ponage and the number of people yeah. that you can, can demean are the notches in your belt that give you the victory title um, and the belt as it were and, this and is when you go into those situations you're just not going in with like a, if you and i disagreed on something we could still respect each other at the end of it mm -hmm. and maybe even understand each other's points better even if we haven't changed our position at all yeah and that's not what you went into in yeah yeah this is um that that that's like one of the things that bothers me the most is that like if you want to go in and you want to say I don't care about the facts or whatever that's fine but it really bothers me that that side of the political aisle they're usually the ones that use fact my facts don't care about your feels as an insult they always say that that's like their calling card like 
look at these mad SJWs that with the purple hair screaming and screeching and they're so mad, haha, and we're all so cool and calm and collected and we have the facts and they argue with our feelings. It's like, that's like unacceptable to me because they, all of them have like the most like feeling based rooted arguments like in the history of the world. Like when you was talking about like how many times have I argued with somebody in this part of the political spectrum and they've appealed to common sense. I, that might have even happened during that six hour conversation where someone's like, do you, do you believe in common sense? And it's like, well, no, of course not. That's like tautological. You're begging the question so hard when you call something common sense like you're already pre- yeah. like that's such a stupid concept no i'm never going to use the phrase common sense because the whole point of arguing a position is, is justify it and common sense by def by definition is unjustified you know or, or justifies yeah, you, itself like uh yeah yeah how are you going to operationalize common sense into a metric that we can yeah. apply universally and agree upon let's have that conversation first and then i'll tell you whether or not i think i accept that there's a thing called common sense yeah common sense just means what I've concluded without very much investigation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh. And yeah, so what seems very obvious from one position, this is it. It's about thinking outside the box. It's about thinking about things from a structural point of view, mm -hmm. from somebody else's lived experience. And some people that don't have, haven't had or don't want to extend their empathy that far to have that conversation or even entertain it. They mm -hmm. just mock the idea of the conversation itself. Yeah. And it's so funny when I get to talk to people like Lauren Southern and like a lot of the arguments that they make, the the, the traditional arguments, they're, the people that are like the hardcore, I think they're called tradcons, trad, traditional conservatives, are the funnest because all you have to do is equate them to Sharia law and then like they crumble, like trying to like explain like why they feel, like when I asked Laura Southern, like um, you, you feel very strongly about what women should wear publicly and she's like, yeah, of course. Like so like if women wear certain things, like they're hardcore sluts and whatnot, she's like, oh yeah, of course. And it's like, okay, well, if you think that women should wear certain things to respect their bodies and to protect men from their, you know, inner demons of wanting to over sexualize women, like why do you dis um, why do you d disagree so much with forcing women to wear um, hijabs? You know, it's like the same thing. It's like, oh, well, that's totally different. It's like, okay, well, what's the difference? It's like, well, I don't execute people for what I believe. And it's like, okay, so the <laughs> only difference between your normative position and that of a of a hardcore fundamental Muslim is that you don't kill people because of what you, but otherwise it's all the same. Like that's your go to. Uh, did you have an opinion on the woman question that was circulating in the alt-right community last month or whatever about whether or not women should be able to be spokespeople for the movement about why women shouldn't be? Oh, no, in, they absolutely you know? shouldn't be. It's totally <laughs> hypocritical. And that, and I want to say that I I, I want to claim a little bit of credit for that because I hammered both Roaming Millennial and Lauren Southern in a, in a big, there was another huge shit show, like one on four debate where I hammered both of them on that question. And the, it was four or five days after it, Lauren started to engage with that idea more. But um, that was something that, that I threw at them a lot in that conversation where it's like, okay, you think that women um, are going to be happier at home, are going to be happier with children, are going to be happier not being in this line of work. What the fuck are you doing here? Why are you even talking to me right now? Like, aren't you making yourself miserable? Like, and, and then, the, you know, the excuses come out. Well, you know, I just want to do this right now, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, that's awesome. Everything you're saying for the right to not have a child right now, the right to pursue a career that makes you happy, the right to do all of these these things, even though you're a woman, this is literally like what feminists have been fighting for. This is like you're literally the product of that. And, and you are a living, breathing example of a woman foregoing early childbearing in order to pursue a career that they otherwise wouldn't be able to if they were forced to stay at home and have children, you know? And it's like, how, how do you not see the glaring fucking hypocrisy um, in, in your position? And then, yeah, a few it's days fascist. later... Oh, sorry, God, yeah. It's fascist. It's fascist feminism. It's, yeah, it's I, feminism for fascist white women. I, maybe I don't even know. I, I I don't think so. I think it's just massive cognitive dissonance. I think it's just a really uh, because like her justification was like um, I think she's twenty three. How old do you know how she Lauren Southern is? I am no, but I you know I'm willing to whatever number yeah, it's, if people want to correct us. It's yeah, it's some really early, low it's some low twenties number, but like her excuse is like, oh well, I'll have a kid soon. I just you know I'm not ready for it yet. It was like this really weird wishy washy. Yeah, twenty two. It was just like this really weird wishy washy thing. Um, I don't even think it's an exception for white women. I think it's literally that um, uh, the the what we talked about earlier, the attribution error that where where it's like, well, other women are just doing it because they're whores and sluts, but I'm I'm not having a kid right now for a really good reason like my message is really important and it's okay for me not to do it but no one else is allowed to make the same choice i think it's more that thing than, than just for white women even oh I'll, I'll concede that one mm -hmm. i don't think yeah i mean the fascist feminism was a bit ironic just as you know she's making feminist arguments for herself you know yeah. within a system that doesn't actually encourage that in any way yeah. or even have a space to 
allow for that. Yep. That's what she's arguing or for, when, um, is her space for that. A, a few days, a while ago, I had a big call, and uh, Tara McCarthy showed up, and she started making arguments. Um, I asked her, I said, um, do you consider Jewish people white people? Um, and I didn't, I, I didn't even know she was half Jewish when I asked this. And she was like, well, if Jewish people want to join the white cause— and they want to kind of advocate on behalf of all of us as white people together, then yeah, sure, I would accept Jews into my ethno state. It's like, okay, well, it sounds like you're talking about the malleability of what it means to be white, which kind of sounds like you're not big on an ethno state, but rather like a collective identity. That, like she was like making any argument that I would make for the arbitrary definition of race, but she was doing it on her own. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, holy shit. Right, well, she was doing that to you know avoid answering your question. Yeah. <laughs> which well, was a typical theme as well. Also because I found out that apparently she's half Jewish, I didn't realize, but yeah. Yeah, but this whole idea of, yeah, I'll, I'll appeal to this group, you know, and what they think they are. Mm -hmm. I'm like, whoa, 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 <laughs> you know, how far are you going to extend that? Because if it's just self-identification, then, you know, again, how do you draw that line, mm -hmm. as you point out? Um, yes, very malleable. That's a problem um, I think that a lot of white people in the um, in the in America. Um, I don't know how big it is in Canada, but in the United States have is that in the United States, um, and I'm speaking a, a little bit generally here, but in the United States, we tend to have a, a little bit of a harder time seeing differences between whiteness, whereas I would argue that in Europe, from the time I spent in Poland and the many times I've been to Germany, people are quicker to, to, to draw the distinction between like a Polish person and a German person and somebody from Scandinavia and somebody from Great Britain. But in the United States, we kind of see all of it as white. Um, I kind of wonder if people realize sometimes that, that in Europe, not everybody sees themselves as the same thing. That's something that I notice a lot when people in, in America talk about like their concept of whiteness, that they're like, oh, well, you know, I want to be white like the European people are. And it's like the European people don't necessarily see themselves as like the European people. Do you not realize that, you know? Yeah, there's a huge difference between, you know, somebody in Romania and yeah. someone in Scandinavia. Yeah. And the other thing is that, you know, not all the people who are Europeans even consider themselves Europeans. We just had Brexit, where, you know, sure. uh, just over half of the voting population said, we're not European, we're British. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Or even like the idea that you would say that like a British person and like a, like an Italian or, or a Frenchman are like, oh, well, you guys are all white Europeans. And it's like, okay, maybe to an American, but that's, you know, uh, I don't know. It is astounding to me just to look through the credits of a movie to see an American movie. If you look through a German movie, you're going to see German names, maybe Turkish names, mm -hmm. um, but you're going to see predominantly German names. And if you go to see a BBC uh, credits at the end of a show, you're going to see a lot of really typically British names. But an American, in those credits, um, American credits have names from all over the world. Mm -hmm. in them and that's the thing about america it's, it's a thing that i'm actually quite proud of about our country is that it's not tied to um, the ideas the ideals not what we are because i don't i don't think we live up to our ideals well, but the ideals because the of, jews are trying to get rid of all of us white people <laughs> right. uh. of what it means to be an american is something that is open to anybody mm-hmm and that I think is really special, and it goes against everything that an, a white ethno state stands for. And yeah. I pick my side. I pick my side. So. Well. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I don't. How long um, these? What? Yeah, I was gonna say I don't know how long. I don't know how long these normally go, but it hasn't felt that long. But it looks like it's been like an hour and a half, although it's flown by. Sure. Are there any other um, are there any other topics or anything that you wanted to bring up or chat about or anything? Well, I mean, I could just very briefly, if mm -hmm. you're interested in, about the whole, um, you know, we have access to the science and there are only two genders kind of debate. My doctoral thesis looked at psychological measures of gender, mm -hmm. and the the two main uh, forms are the personal attributes questionnaire and the BEM sex role inventory. And for my thesis, I ended up using the PAQ, the, the personal attributes questionnaire. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when that test was developed, the way they developed it was in the 1970s, psychologists started to rethink gender as being binaries and more like a spectrum mm -hmm. and so they wanted to get an idea of what are masculine and feminine norms in our society they did this in the way that psychologists often do by using undergraduate students mm -hmm. so they had a bunch of their white middle class american undergraduate students brainstorm what what attributes would you associate with the ideal man 
and the ideal woman. And they collected those from like, I don't know how many the dozens of students where they collected all of these um, brainstorming exercises. And from that, they got like the most popular ones. And they turned that into a battery of masculine and feminine. And then they took that test and they applied it to the next <laughs> group of, of undergraduates that were coming through. They looked at the scores and what they found was that men scored higher on measures that were considered masculine and women scored higher on the ones that were considered feminine. But when they came to develop their categories, what they noticed it was not the case that men were scoring really high on the masculine and zero on the feminine, or women high on the feminine and zero on the masculine. There was a there was a range, there was a distribution. distribution so some yeah. people Right. So if you took the mean of like seven hundred students and let's say the mean score for the masculine battery was twenty three, anybody at or above the mean you would say would be high on that particular score. And what they found was they had to have four categories of high and low, high masculine, low feminine, high feminine, low masculine, high masculine and feminine, and then low masculine and feminine. Mm -hmm. So even within the way that our society constructs notions of masculinity, um, biological sex does not determine the normative or social, sociological sort of associations that we have for men and women in our society. Mm -hmm. And my research showed, because the whole point of my thesis was to say, look, in social science, when we do political science, we ask people if they're a man or a woman. Those are the two categories that we've provided traditionally. I don't know that it's ever has changed for um, official government and sort of social surveys. And then we would say, well, if women are scoring higher on something like approval of censorship in a society, which is a common score in British society, mm -hmm. the conclusion would be, well, women are more likely to be mothers. Mothers are concerned about the information their children are exposed to. Therefore, they're more in favor of censorship than men are on average. And my point was, well, you're making a leap from being a woman to being a mother and having these values. So I ran some of the same regression analyses on things like left-right scale and authoritarian, libertarian, capitalist, la um, socialist laissez-faire scales. And what I found was that actually how people scored on, I didn't call them gender measures because gender is actually, I'm sorry, yeah, I didn't use the gendered terms for the measures like masculine or feminine because if someone, if a guy scores high, you, you know, say he's got high femininity score, it just doesn't, you know, or, or for a woman. So I used agency yeah. for the masculine because it's about like, competitiveness, independence, um, separateness, sort of. And for um, femininity, communion was the term that was being used in psychology because it talks about being kind to others and being helpful, sure. connectedness. And there's not as many assumptions like baked into the word masculine and feminine, right? Right. Yeah. Precisely. Precisely. What I found was that those added, those sort of perspectives on whether or not someone thought they were competitive or connected was a better predictor than their biological sex category. Not all the time, and sometimes both were important, but the wait, 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 fundamental... right, hold on, hold on, wait. I just so I understand yeah. exactly what you're saying. So you're <laughs> saying that when you ran this analysis, you're saying that whether or not they were the two categories were you said communion versus yeah agency agency. You said that that was a better predictor of what of what gender they identified with or their actual biological. No, no, um, like no, they're a left right scale. Oh, okay, instance, okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, where they where where they scored on political things. Uh, oh, okay. so where oh, so, so something where higher communion. Gotcha. So something where previously, instead of communion, people would have said woman, something where people would say, well, if you're a woman, this gives us a high degree of predictiveness using an analysis you showed. Well, actually, there are things that can make you appear as a woman. And if we go to these baser things, this gives us higher predictiveness of whether you're left or right leaning, leaning right? Exactly. Okay, so okay. when I put my attributes into the model, mm -hmm. I'll just say you a technical term, sex became statistically insignificant in several of my models. That means all the explanatory power that sex was picking up without those measures was now completely accounted for by the masculine or the communion agency measures. Yeah, and then that had greater predictive power and more precise right. predictive power. Yeah, gotcha. And so that means that a guy who is uh, reports high communion is going to be more left-wing. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh than a woman who is, let's say, it wasn't doctors and lawyers and sort of um, sort of A-level, what they say, like professionals. It was managers, um, people who had management positions that had the highest degree of agency. So if you have a woman who's running her own business, she's going to be more um, right-leaning politically. Mm -hmm. And she's going to be more capitalist, not because she's a woman in this case, but because of a sort of where she is located in her, you know, sort of in her life or 
her sense of um, her independence and competitiveness and separateness. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, so that was, I thought, an interesting finding. And it, it goes to, I think, uh, to challenge this fundamental notion that, you know, there's men and there's women and there's something essential about them that is determined by their biology that then has implications for how we should structure our social life. Sure. And I think my findings basically show that that's not a very sound explanation for why people hold the political attitudes they do. Yeah, which is especially interesting because not only, um, like, not, not only may there be sex I- identities that do manifest in political ways, but these have also been. It's interesting that your regression would show this, even when we reinforce what we believe to be true about men and women in society as well. Right? That you could your regression could fail and you could still argue that it's possible that um in a different society people would look a different way because we socially enforce gender roles so much but even though we do enforce the gender roles your research can still show that 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 being a man or a woman isn't necessarily more predictive than some other quality if that makes sense exactly and, it, and there are core cohort effects mm-hmm. so when you see an agency younger men men under the age of 25 have the highest sense of their own agency and then it kind of drifts down <laughs> as they get to retirement age sure. uh, but their communion goes up especially later in life whereas with older women um, their communion pretty much stays the same across across the cohorts that i looked at but younger women have a higher sense of their own agency where um, by the time you get to the 65 and older women and men are, are pretty much the same in terms of their means mm-hmm. On that score. So the other thing too is, you know, when you go through life and you gain experience, it sort of changes your perspective, changes who you are, um, and that sometimes is associated with masculinity or femininity. Or you live a little bit and you get more compassion because you've seen things, you've lost people that you loved, and you can empathize with other people who've gone through bad times. Um, so life experience too can have an impact on our sense of uh, connectedness to others and also our sense of our own efficacy. Yeah. So that's like, I think that's kind of interesting. I haven't published it yet because mm-hmm. I was going to do a book and then I didn't do the book and it's kind of hard to write all of this in one article. So sure. I have an unwritten book that should get published someday, but that's fundamentally the the findings of my thesis. And since you seem like a kind of nerdy person, um, I thought you would find it interesting and it seems like you did, yeah, which makes me happy. Interesting. It's so amazing for a PhD student. Not, I have been, haven't been one for, for a while now, but when someone finds your doctoral research interesting, that's like... <laughs> finding a four-leaf clover yeah it's i can like... <laughs> imagine because you spend so much work on it and 99 percent right. of people probably couldn't give a fuck less yeah <clears throat> the um i think that um i i talk a little bit about this on stream i, I kind of stay away from this stuff um just because it's not usually re- related to what we're talking about but um a- everything relating to gender and all of that um i guess it kind of ties into i'm a, i'm a very big so in growing up i, I was very libertarian, very individualist. And a lot of this has stayed with me such that I still think it's really important. Um, I think there's value in being an individual, but I also recognize the importance of understanding people as classes and how people experiencing things as, experience things as part of classes. Um, but one thing that I've kind of kept with me is I'm very, very much um, pro people thinking for themselves and very much anti um, group association. So like I have very negative um, feelings towards things like nationalism or, or group identity. Like I, I like I try to when I think of myself, you know, I'll list things like being white, like last, like I like to think of my own accomplishments or, or more unique personality traits. Um, and I guess as part of that, I end up grouping in like gender with that as well. And I notice that a lot of people will will have like very strong inclinations towards like I am a man, male, blah blah blah. Um, but I don't really think about it much that way in terms of like oh like I feel very like straight is a huge part of my identity or being male is a huge part of my identity or whatever. Um, and I feel like I don't know like when you, when you look at how genders like. I guess manifest in our society. It seems like if you were to like hardcore think about it, most of it would end up just existing on a spectrum anyway. To where it would be like really hard to find like a, a particular like male or female point. I would. I mean, yeah. I think that because what we're, you know, even within biology and in nature, there's variation in terms of how X Y chromosomes map up and. Mm-hmm. Um, other different ways that you can have one set of genes but but display the sex characteristics of the opposite sex. So I think that the androgen resistant um, condition and thinking of in particular. Mm-hmm. And the same thing with society. I mean, 
200 years ago, guys were wearing, you know, really sexy hoses that showed off their calves. Sure. Um, or maybe it was 400 years ago. Um, and today, so we have, guys sometimes wear earrings and jewelry and whatnot, yeah. Right, yeah. So we have this, we can say it's a biological constant, even if there's consistency in the variation, right, mm -hmm. um, over time. But on, that, on top of that overlay is, uh, are the social constructs and the meanings that we attribute to being that society attributes to one gender or the other, or being a third gender or yeah. being binary. Um, and then how we also feel about it, how we comport ourselves to who we are and how we fit in that society. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's super complicated. And I know, you know, it's also frustrating for me as an atheist and a feminist, that one of the things that I brought to my critique of, of Christianity and all basically the monotheist well, all religions, if I'm honest, is um, the the assumed, the sexism that's built in to it. And I thought yeah. getting out of it and getting into the atheist community, I would be joining a group of humanists oh, who God, would start no. with a fundamental <laughs> principle, right, of human I'm equality. I'm so sorry. Would, yeah. And what I got instead were a lot of atheists who were just as patriarchal as Moses or Abraham or yeah. any other, you know. Shed one social um, construct for another. Yeah. Basically, the um, I wouldn't have as much of a um, I wouldn't have as much of a problem with a binary gender system. I guess I wouldn't care as much. The only thing that sucks though is that it just it seems like most traits are straight. Like I would argue that in society's view, being female is just typically it's a strictly negative. Like every female attribute is typically negative compared to the to the male one. Um, and like we even have insults that are built around this. You know, like you throw like a girl, or you're being a whiny bitch, or you're being a little pussy. Um, like the implic you're acting like a woman like did you leave your purse in your car like the implication being um this insult works because you're a man why the fuck would you lower yourself to acting like a woman like that's why that's where those insults all derive their power from right and it seems like if, if you line up like if you ask people to list traits that are masculine versus traits that are feminine like and not there there are some women that enjoy this and that's great but most of the feminine traits are usually pretty shitty <laughs> like like if you ask <laughs> me, what does it mean to be masculine it's like okay well you have pride and honor um you're the caretaker you build you build things you know you're uh, you're intelligent you're driven you're motivated you're passionate you're you know you have all these awesome you're strong you're a protector like these are the masculine traits and it's like well what are you if you're a female um you know well you can be pretty beautiful um for men um you can be graceful i so you look better for men um you can be a mom so you can take care of your kids um for your husband um it's very self-negating smooth yeah like pretty pretty much um most of your you positive giving, traits are usually giving. described yeah. like in relation to other men like like um like what well, you know these are things that you want like you're beautiful like you usually so that men can like you and shit and you have all of these like weird yeah and it's like there's just like not really many like on, on that spectrum of like masculine versus feminine like usually the masculine trait is like so much better than like the feminine one like why would you ever want to trade positions with a woman when, when masculine traits are better in like every single way you know i think that people who see people who are non-binary or um, are willing to transgress that line. I, I'm thinking particularly of the fact that, and this is, I first heard it from Eddie Izzard, uh, the fact that men don't have clothing equality. As a woman, or women in general, right? If you put a woman in a man's button-down Oxford, you know, yeah. it, she's going to look sexy in that. Sure. Um, but men, except, well, it's kilts, all right, but a guy isn't going to go out most times in a dress unless he's you know, dressing up for some kind of po costume or party or whatever, right? It's always for a, a lark. Um, and, and so that kind of reinforces what you were saying, that if there was sort of true gender clothing equality and men could wear poodle skirts <laughs> and just as well as, you know, women can wear trousers, then, or even mixing things up between the two just making clothes clothes mm -hmm. and not having gendered clothing yeah that takes away that certainty of you know i'm i'm often reminded when we have these kinds of, when i have these kinds of discussions of that line from one of the iron man movies where tony stark is arguing with um what his girlfriend whose name escapes me at the moment but uh, he, he was just as the man says no as if like that has carried some weight sure well, I, but I mean, socially, you know? yeah. <laughs> That that's um that arguing about clothing that's actually a really funny thing um, when I argue about anything related to trans stuff like um on like Twitter you know is that like a lot of people will talk about like your gender is the same as your genitals 
period. And, and, and that's how it should be, like, from a social perspective. And, you know, it's like, okay, well, when you meet somebody, how do you know what genitals they have? Like, for 99.99% of people that you meet, you have no idea. Like, you can't really, you can't really tell if somebody has an XY versus an XX. You can't really tell that. And then, you know, like, even like what you said, you know, there are, you know, androgen receptor um you know, errors that can cause cause men to become women, become women because, you know, they, they can't, their body can't process the testosterone. Um, and like when pe- people will go into things like, okay, well, you know, men usually look a certain way and women usually start, like what, like in what ways, you know, like the way they dress, because that can be changed socially, like having body hair, because that can be changed socially, having short hair versus long hair, wearing makeup. Like these are all things that are 100% social things. Like just because you look at women and they tend to have vaginas or look at men and they tend to have dicks, like a lot of that is literally just like, I don't want. I don't like to overuse the word social construct, but I mean, like, it's people that play into their into the roles that society kind of tells them that they have to play into. But you don't really know, you know, what sex somebody is without actually seeing their genitals. You know, I I do when teaching my students about social constructionism because again, as qualitative researcher, which is where my research has taken me since my PhD, you have to understand where people are coming from, right, right and understand their understanding of the world. And I think when you're having conversations with people who are like, there are two genders and it matches your genitals sort of conversations, my only way to kind of relate to it is, you know, when you had those those pictures where if you focused your eyes slightly ahead, you saw a 3D image come out of just sort of random dots. Okay. Magic eye, I think they were called. I've seen a lot it's of these. I've probably seen it before, but yeah. Um. You know, they're kind of going through life seeing a painting of how things are, not realizing it's completely socially constructed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? um, they just have, they see it as an existing thing. It's sort of, um, it's like your sense of yourself. If you have to point to the essence of who you are, where do you point? You point to your body, that, that's not your consciousness. You point to your brain, that's not. So it, there's a sense of yourself, a sense of an eye that exists, that's independent. But if you actually had to point at it, you realize it's like a rainbow and when you try to grab it, it sort of disappears. Yeah. And that magic eye of seeing the social construction of gender is, I think, for some people, it it um, it again, it's the instability because it, the illusion is that it's all very firm. It's just based yeah. on your chromosomes, and you start to pull it apart, and you realize that it is completely. It's not completely arbitrary, but it's based on customs mm-hmm. that are, in some ways, arbitrary, or at least influenced by our biology which we should have superseded by now as rational beings sure we don't have to stay in social structures because yeah. that's how our pack ancestors evolved and yeah. that and this kind of circles back to the original thing in terms of thought process like um i don't think i'm quite as extreme as a lot of like trans advocates like um or, or even some feminists or I, i'm not sure it depends on how extreme you're like i would i would acknowledge that in a perfect world i still think you would see differences between men and women in terms of careers they would choose and whatnot i don't think that difference would be 90 10 like in all of engineering but there would probably still be some differences that manifest um just based on biological differences in some regards um but but i think like if people would would understand that like okay you know like i you know i feel a particular way about say like my gender or whatever but i understand that a lot of it might be somewhat arbitrary that it's a lot easier to accept that like okay well you know this person wants to you know be whatever society says a woman is i don't really think that's a big deal because all of these things that i think are intrinsic to being a man are really just socially constructed so it's not a big deal if somebody decides to run a little bit contrary to that it's not like they're denying their biological nature or some shit My question is always like, fundamentally, who cares what they're doing if it makes them happy and they're not hurting anybody? I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, I that's also that, well. The, the Shapiro insistence. answer is the Shapiro answer is I'm not going to deny scientific reality just to ease your discomfort or some shit would be the, Sh- the Shapiro answer. But um, yeah, I guess that's what creationists do as well. Yeah, uh, or think but like, they're doing it. Yeah, that's that's yeah, I, Unfortunately, this is really depressing to say, but I never argue uh, compassionate angles. I always focus on fact and figure because compassion is is not compatible with with the, the point of view of most of these people. Um, I might I would probably use that argument with my son. Um, like you know, if he were to ask me, like Dad, like why, whatever, you know, I'd be like, well, okay, well, you know, people can make choices, and you want people to be happy, and you want people to want you to be happy, so let let people do what makes them happy, as long as they're not hurting anybody else. And from a compassionate point of view, that should be enough, you know. Like if somebody says, people make such a huge deal about this, and all the arguments are so dumb. Somebody's like, you don't have a right to be called 
anything you want to be. And it's like, motherfucker, have you seen my birth certificate? You don't even know if my name is really <laughs> Steven. Like, I could introduce myself to you as any fucking name that I want, yeah. and you would call me that name. Like, why are you acting like there's some, like, your name is literally tattooed onto your fucking neck at birth, and, like, people have to address you in a certain way. Like, if somebody says they want to be called she or he, it's not a big deal. You know, like, I can do that. It's not, it's not any trouble for me. Like, why would I care how somebody wants to be addressed? You know, isn't that really the ultimate right of any person? As long as they're not, like, demanding a title or something that carries some social weight. You know, like if somebody wants to be addressed as a he or a she or a Shannon or, 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 a, you know, a shepherd or whatever. Does it really matter? I, I mean, I don't, but I could insist people address me as Dr. Winters. Mm-hmm. A- and, and so that's that. Well, it's not the merely an identification. I actually have the title. Yeah. But well, that's why I was saying like for titles, like if somebody demanded yeah. to be called doctor or like king something, like I could understand taking issue with that. that that's a little different if they're not <laughs> yeah. actually a king or a doctor. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If it's fraud, but like seriously, what is it? What what does it take out of your day to mm-hmm. say she? I and the thing is, you know, is, is you kind of point out um, th- this insistence of of misgendering somebody. I'm I'm to the point now where, you know, I I now have enough friends. I didn't have any friends who were trans. Like mm-hmm. trans issues were theoretical to me until yeah. about five years ago. Now, if I were to hear one of my friends misgendered, it wouldn't be any different than if someone misgendered me. Yeah. You know, so I I, uh. I yeah the this whole sort of like dichotomous world. I I don't under, I don't understand like you said the compassion part of it. What does that take? And I guess the problem is that they're restricting their compassion because um, they would rather impute their reality onto others rather than respect the reality that's in front of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fuck. Yeah, I don't know. People are fucking crazy. <laughs> I have to do, it's hard because I do the same thing with my immigration debates as well. Like all of that, I always come at that from like a purely like fact numbers thing. But like, are you familiar with Lauren Southern? Yeah, uh, a little. I mean, I know her um, antics seen, like, on the sea. Yeah, her. Tr- yeah, like that takes like you have to have a. There's like a special level of like piece of shit, disgusting human being yeah. you have to be. To, first of all, you're not even. Um, was it Spain or Italy? The coast that they were doing it off of. I don't even remember. Um, like you're not even part of this fucking country. So why are you there defending their waters? And then like you're, like ah, but it's like it's the. Um, it, it it goes. It actually goes back to that fundamental attribution error again, where it's like people are illegally immigrating because they're you know pieces of shit that want to steal from our country or some shit, you know. Like, and it's like, I mean, like as a father, like if my kid was hungry or my family was in a shitty situation, I'm gonna break every fucking law I can to put myself in a better position. You better fucking believe it. And like people that like dehumanize the fuck out of immigrants that are trying to get to other areas, it's like Jesus, you gotta you have to be like a really special piece of shit to do that. Oh my God. I, our family lore, according to what I've been told, is that um, one of the members of my family actually uh, came into the United States on false papers under somebody else's name. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the idea that somehow we've just had a problem with people coming into the country without their papers being in order, which, by the way, is not a criminal offense. It's a civil offense. Mm-hmm. Um, we should point out they're not criminals. They could be you know, charged in civil court for a civil crime. But um, as you say, the, the numbers for me always seem to – it makes more sense to bring people out of the black economy into the economy where they're paying taxes and they're part of the system than to keep them outside of it. I think you know, compassion – yeah, I, I, on the immigration debate, I can definitely understand um, you don't have to rely on a compassion yeah. argument because the economics – of our, our, our doing an amnesty are yeah. so overwhelmingly positive. yeah i don't want to say settled but it's like like the best you can do is argue about fiscal impact like economically the argument is totally lost but this is a this is again another reason why i'm glad like the ethno state people exist because at least i don't pretend to have that argument anymore and and usually when i start to get into debates with these people um it, ha- it happened with lauren southern they'll uh, as soon as they realize that they're totally fucking hopeless on it they'll concede that argument immediately and they'll go well that's okay um you know actually sargon did this to me um even we're Sargon said, I don't care about the economic argument. That's not important. You know, it's like, oh, interesting. So we're literally supposed to make economic sacrifices for your personal ideology? Like, okay, well, that's a much tougher sell now. Do you not realize that? You know? uh. The political results after Brexit were that people who voted for Brexit were fully aware that there might be economic um, problems mm-hmm. that result as a consequence of leaving the EU, but they were more interested in having autonomy over immigration and felt that that was... Um, a necessary sort of price to pay in order to get that autonomy back. 
that's actually so completely consistent yeah. <laughs> with uh, yeah not caring about the economics in order in order to, so that the ideology can pervade yeah and persevere Jeez. when i debated the reason i did i think i did quite well i think most people think i did pretty well with my in my debate with carl and mm. but the main difference was that ours was structured and so we each had like 10 minutes or whatever for an opening argument and then there was a five minute rebuttal and then another five minute segment and then whatever else so that there was a, a structured time limit the thing about it was the question we were debating was is feminism a force for good in the world mm-hmm. and my argument was that yes it has been uh, throughout time first second and third wave and now we have intersectional feminism where a lot of the critiques from earlier waves are being incorporated and people who whose voices were marginalized and all this sort of stuff things that are being dealt with across the world and carl decided to go bizarrely after social science yeah. for a while and then in his next two bits where he just had to talk he just sort of ad hommed and talked about like blue-haired feminists and it was just a complete shit show because <sighs> he was actually not allowed to interrupt me he wasn't allowed to ask a question instead of uh, answering a question and he wasn't allowed to use any of his usual tactics so i would say anyone who ever wants to have another interaction with sargon would be like okay you i've just listened to you talk for four minutes and 57 seconds now i'm going to talk for the same amount of time uninterrupted mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, because that's the format when he actually has to put together a coherent argument and he can't just grandstand. That's where he falls apart. Yeah. Did you ever see his conversation with uh, Michael Brooks? Oh, that was amazing. Oh, yes, I watched that in God. prep. I watched that in prep for our debate. <laughs> 30 minutes of not being able to define what is a... I, uh, somebody pointed me to that one, and I was really curious because they're like, oh, you always say that Sargon never talks about, uh, like, re- like with qualified people about foreign issues. And and I'm always like, no, Sargon's an idiot. There's no way that he could hold his own in a conversation like that. And then somebody's like, well, check out his conversation with Michael Brooks. And I started listening to it. And I think after listening to Brooks talk for, like, three minutes, I was like, there's no way. Like, how is Sargon going to survive this guy? Like, this guy knows, like, actual, like, figureheads in the Muslim community. He can probably point to most of the countries in the Middle east on a map like there's no way and then like the whole conversation is this massive shit show of sargon calling yep. him a regressive leftist and not being able to define it at all my the, my big this this is actually why i started getting into it is my big issue with all of these issues um the big problem i have with all of these issues that people on the right or the skeptic or whatever bring up is they're always like so fucking trivial like you'll say something like um let's talk about the problems in the united states okay healthcare that's a huge problem immigration is a huge problem um not just people coming but just getting the system fixed you know um our, our economy there are, this is a hugely um a hugely diverse problem you know we've got the intersection of um free trade agreements of globalism uh, of of our supply versus there's a ton of different things going on here service versus uh, manufacturing and shit um and then it's like, okay, and then their side is like, okay, like, I see that you think those issues are important, but did you see this one college protest? Like, did you see this co- this one college professor who got mad at this student because they had a MAGA hat on? Or, like, did you see this um, protest where this blue-haired woman said death to uh, white people? And it's like, dude, like, are these really the most important problems? Like, these are the things that you think are, like, the things that are impacting all of the United States right now? Like, doesn't this seem like kind of a little bit overblown? Like, uh, like an editorial article from the New York Times is more important than anything having to do with, like, Russian interference with our election process like the 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 reframing of like they'll take like a one or two like people protesting and make it like it's this worldwide fucking epidemic of liberals taking over is just so overblown and so tired their channels are the coliseum and it's you know they are the lions going up against the christians but in this case the christians are the feminists and the sjws and black lives matter and, and antifa because you know what we really need to do is be opposed to the people who are opposed to fascism that's yeah. <laughs> to, well, who aren't even really, really like and even if you don't like antifa like antifa is a fucking joke in the united states like they, yeah. they don't they don't really do at least like and i don't i don't even know as much so i try not to have as harsh an opinion but like antifa in europe seems like some scary shit based at least on the on the videos i've seen and it might be that the videos are not very representative but they seem like super shit but in the united states antifa is fucking harmless like jesus christ they're like so not ineffective but like they don't really do much like it's a pretty small you know my dad was posting on facebook that he was getting his gun ready for the antifa super soldier (laughs) shit oh my god (laughs) oh dude that was an amazing day that was so much fun (laughs) Uh, 
Um, yeah, I mean, I just, my experience, Europeans whose grandparents or, you know, their history involved living under fascism tend mm -hmm. to be much more intense in their anti-fascism. I think, you know, anti-fascism in the United States, I mean, there's black bloc and, you know, and Antifa itself isn't even really a group. It's more like a, a what, like a action that happens from time to time. Sure. And if people feel that there's a fascist um, making a public appearance, um, but uh, yeah, in terms of its intensity, I mean, we, how many times in the last two months have people been uh, murdered by neo Nazis? That that seven, the kid who um, the parents tried to get their daughter to break up with him because they thought he was a neo Nazi. Oh, did there he were, kill they, like the mom and the daughter or some shit? Yeah, or? yeah. family. I think that dude. If it was a fucking. Oh my god. This is like sometimes I wish that like I could see like alternate realities like if this would have been this what the fuck would the response have been? Could yeah. you fucking imagine if the Las Vegas shooter had been a fucking Muslim? Holy shit. Oh, we would yeah. still be talking about it to this day. Yeah. But like no one even cares anymore cuz it was a fucking white dude. Like we're done with that. Like after a, after like 2 weeks we were done with that shit. Because if we talk about him, we have to talk about like gun control like and fuck that conversation, you know? Like yeah, no way. Or even mental health or whatever. Both things that Republicans don't give a fuck about. Um, um, but since it was a white dude, like no one cared. And there are even more troubling stories than that. Um, in some in some small airport, there was a white dude that tried to actually bomb the fucking plane. Like they caught. Um, I don't know if you heard about this or not. I don't even remember where this article was. But this was like somewhat recent, like within the past couple months. There was a white dude that um, that that had like he brought like a, like a nail bomb or some shit into an airport, and they ended up catching him. This got no coverage on like any mainstream news channel. Nobody cared at all about it. And if it would have been a Muslim, we would be talking about it. You know, nonstop, it would have been added to the list. Even Trump did it um, when there was the uh, when there was the shooting, and I think it was a Canadian church. And uh, the initial reports were that it was a Muslim, and he was tweeting shit about how you know this is why we need stronger borders and blah blah blah. And then it turned out that the Muslim guy was the one that turned in the shooter or some shit, and then nobody cared about it anymore. Ugh. Mm -hmm. No, it is the case that if we really wanted to talk about the problem of mass shootings in the United States, we'd have to talk what is happening with with white men. Because disproportionately, these mass shooters end up being white men. And we'll talk about the radicalization of young Muslim men, but we're not talking about what are the the factors and the things that are happening um, that are producing this. It's a really uniquely American yeah. phenomenon. I'm not saying that there aren't other white guys who go on mass sprees. You know, you've got the guy in that awful person in, um, was it Norway, where he killed um, this um, young people, but the the amount of shooters just in an average year mm -hmm. in the United States is is ridiculous. Yeah, and yet because it's white men, as you point out, we don't talk about the mm -hmm. Las Vegas. People still bring up the Boston bombing, Boston Marathon bombing, mm -hmm. but they yeah. won't talk about the Vegas shooter. Yeah, the a really funny question, um, and I've gotten to ask this question a couple of times, and you watch people squirm is um, when when talking about immigration, when people are like, okay, well, you know what? Um, Fuentes actually brought this up against me. He was like, all immigration is bad because if a single American life is killed by an illegal immigrant, like that's unacceptable. It's like, okay, do you think that like should we heavily restrict our immigration then to people that won't commit violent crimes, most people will instantly say yes to that. And then if you say, okay, why don't we restrict our immigration to women only? Because like the by far, violent crime is committed by men. Like it's like a 93 to like 7. It's like a massively disappointing. Like if you just restrict your immigration to only women, the amount of violent crime will will drop dramatically. But they but they'll never agree to that position. And then you have to watch them like wiggle um, wiggle around and like, well, that's not realistic. Uh, blah blah blah. On like how they try to escape that one. Yeah, it's interesting the sort of biological categories or, or things that they want to take into account and want to leave <laughs> to the side, yeah. even though. You know, there's a much, um, there's a more empirically valid basis for the exclusion of men based on a propensity to commit crime mm -hmm. than there is on on people who are immig immigrants actually coming in. If you look at the total number of people who are coming in as immigrants, and then what percentage of those actually commit crimes and the severity of those crimes, mm -hmm. you know, the numbers would be obviously not even close. Yeah. So. But that's logic. I mean, and, and this is it. It's, it's part of the recognition of, of how arbitrary their positions are because they want to feel righteous. Yeah. They want to feel justified in their conclusions. They want to make that is-ought leap. 
Yeah. You know, sort of, I can describe something, therefore, my position on this is correct. This, I and think, the world biological prescriptivism or something, or this this idea that, like, they're, they're, we can, like, uh, derive morals from biological truths that, like, uh, yeah. Yeah, and it's um, it's a complete, yeah, it's as much of a fallacy as we were sort of talking about the thing on gender as um, the value of a currency. You can have a piece of paper that's an American dollar or a euro mm -hmm. and hold on to it for two years and its value is going to change even though it's the same piece of paper. Mm -hmm. What's driving that? There's nothing objective. It's all perception of people's perception of the value of that currency. It's the entire economic system is based on us treating currencies that we th that are worth what we think they're worth because that's how much we think they're worth. Like sure. the Bitcoin bubble. You know, that's going to, I'm sure, collapse at some point. Sure. Um, and there's a lot of that in our societies, but we don't tend to see it, even though it's, it, economics will determine the outcome of people's lives. It's not a force of nature. Mm -hmm. It's a completely constructed human environment that people are put into. Um, but we don't see it that way. We see it as there's the rich class and they're better than us and then the poor people and the unemployed and they're the laziest and the worst off, you know, the worst of all. Mm -hmm. um, and these perceptions, when you start to unpack them, they become, it, it can be very unsettling if you think you've got the world all figured out. Yeah. I think. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of economics and kids and whatnot, I have to feed mine, so. <laughs> yeah. This is, it doesn't feel like this is the first time we talked. It feels like we met at a conference or something and we're having a bit of a chat catching up. It was sure. really nice. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Uh, after spending so much time sunken in on the insanity. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, super, the super ironic thing is that when people ask me, um, like, over recently, like, of all the people that you've debated against, you've, like, really disagreed with, who gave you the best debate? The saddest thing is that it was actually the Amos guy with the pedophilia thing, because, like, any time I would give him, like, a point, he would have to consider it and try to counter it, as opposed to just, like, screaming me down. That was, like, really sad that, like, a literal guy that was advocating for no consent ages at, at all seems to be able to argue better or give a better justification for his crazy belief than, like, every single person on that other end of the political aisle that I've talked to. Holy shit, it's insane. That's depressing. Yeah. In a deep, dark way. Yeah. In a deep, deep, dark way. Um, what is your... Get on um, that bombshell. <laughs> yeah. What is your um, Twitter and YouTube and shit? I can link it for my chat. Yeah, yeah. So on Twitter, it's uh, at kwint, E, I, E, at the end. My YouTube channel, because I get so much hate, you're going to have to actually type in <laughs> Christy Winter's channel. Otherwise, you're just going to get all kinds of people saying ridiculous things about me. Gotcha. Um, so you can go there. I've been talking recently about uh, with my friend Kevin Logan, who also has a great channel. Mm -hmm. We've been basically having popcorn sessions over the whole um, burning of the skeptic community. It goes back to <laughs> start of, <laughs> if you because go back, of the like, crowd well, guy. <laughs> yeah. What yeah, because he oh came after God. both of us. He came after both of us. You know, so watching him flame out from basically being hoisted in his own petard. Yeah, I was like, I'm so full up on popcorn. He was but, the guy uh, that made yeah. the. He was the guy that made the stupid fucking immigrant map, right? The Einzel whatever. It thing was the map. one where like I, you click the button and you could see all the crimes committed by immigrants. I mostly remember Sean's response to that. Yeah, more than I remember. going so through the ninety three arsons, where I think all yes. ninety three of them, I think, were <laughs> kitchen fires. Oh my yes. god. Burning toast equals arson. Yeah, <laughs> holy. And then Kraut tried to counter that with like, well, actually, under German law, the technical definition of arson does include. And it's like, that because that was the point of your dude. map, dude, was to show that immigrants everywhere were setting fucking toasters on fire. Good job, dude. Real intellectually honest there, buddy. Uh, I'd like to see the migrant to non-migrant toast burning ratio. Yeah. I wonder if Asian well, people are uh, more likely to burn your toast. Yeah, that well, that's the fucking big thing. That's the huge thing that, like, statistics are the worst thing that nobody seems to understand. Where somebody will point out and they'll be like, okay, people do this all the time with Pew stats. Well, they'll go, look at Muslims. 32% of Muslims think that blah, 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 blah. And it's like, wow, that's a pretty shitty number. I totally agree with you. Can you give me the same number for Christians now? And they're like, well, yeah. no. Why? Why does that matter? Well, what am I supposed to be disgusted and 
comparison to? And it's like, well, that's not relevant. Okay, well, what if the number was 40% for, for Christians? Now, all of a sudden, Muslims look like an incredibly progressive group, you know? Or what if the number is 10%? Then Muslims look a lot worse. Why do you not understand that you need the baseline? De- you, you're making a comparison. You know, when, when you call them, you know, worse than something else, well, worse than what, you know? And that immigrant, uh, that immigrant fucking crime map was the same thing. It's like, okay, wow, that's a, you know, that's a lot of immigrant crime when I push that button and all the things come up. Now, where can I push the button to check native crime? I'm curious what it looks like in comparison. Uh. Yep. Exactly. And that's, you know, and you're completely right. And you saying these things and making people aware of them is the best way to pull the curtain back so that people will go, hey, you know, Destiny made a good point compared to what with what? what are, what's my baseline reference here? What mm-hmm. about atheists? What about other groups? No. Yeah. Critical thinking, as you said. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, hey, I had fun. Um, we'll probably talk again at some point in the future. It'd be great. Yeah. I'll yeah, see you. and I'll see. hopefully next time I'll get my Skype to work properly. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks for the conversation, buddy. <laughs> All right, talk to you. Bye. Later, bye-bye.